Good morning, everyone, except for uh, people that think Zendaya has a boyfriend. She doesn't. They are just friends. So stop tagging me in that Twitter post. Matt, I don't know if you even know who Zendaya is at this point. She might be a little uh, out of your, your age category. But Oh, whoa. Oh, I moisturize. <laughs> hey. I, I could tell. Hey, you, you, hey. You look very yeah, I'm pretty keeping these there. wrinkles at bay, buddy. No, nah, you, you look very pretty over there. Um, I'm excited to get you on the camera today. It is Monday morning, which means we are going behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry. We are peeling back the curtains a little bit. There is no player analysis here. There's no game, team, coach analysis. This is all about the industry. <laughs> this is all about the industry itself. That's how I feel when we're done with fantasy football as well. I don't want to talk about players anymore. We want to talk about the social side. We want to talk about the marketing the engagement, the advertising, sponsorships, all of the things that encapsulate what goes on behind the scenes for content creators, for people building a brand, for people building a business. Now, uh, today's guest is Mr. Matt Kelly of the Roto Underworld Radio Podcast. He is also the creator of playerprofiler.com. Both of those are significant resources for myself in the fantasy football industry. If Mr. Matt Kelly is on a podcast, if he has his queued up to go, his audio airwaves are in my ear. I don't think I've missed a podcast that he has personally put out in a very long time. He has taught me a lot, especially about the game of dynasty fantasy football. And if you've been watching my um, analysis videos of fantasy football over the last couple of years, you have no doubt seen me uh, post many clips about player profiler on my videos. It is a very significant resource, probably the most popular in the industry right now. If I had to take a guess, I don't, I don't have the raw numbers uh, off the top of my head, but uh, more importantly than you creating both of those pieces of content and resources, I think you are building your brand the correct way. And I think you are building something that has a ton of depth to it, a ton of loyalty to it. And the, the focus of this entire series is to bring people on who I think are innovating the industry and doing things that you are doing. And uh, I think you are, are doing it tremendously well and you're seeing it through the growth and the loyalty of your audience. And I, I want to bring on a very wide variety of people for this series because I think it goes to show the people in the audience, whether you're in other industries or you're trying to break through as a content creator in this industry, people come from all different walks of lives. They, they break through in many different ways, whether it is creating a website, whether it's being a podcaster or on YouTube or a blogger, whatever it is, I want to get a wide variety of people so that you could see that no matter where you're coming from, there is a way through. You just have to be a little bit unique. You have to be a little bit thoughtful. You have to be able to put the work in. And that's why we're here. So Matt Kelly, thank you for joining us in the headquarters. I am, uh, I'm super pumped to talk to you because I genuinely mean everything I said about your resources and your content. You are uh, one of the most exciting people, polarizing people in the industry right now. Let's talk. Don't forget polarizing. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. And there's nothing I like more than to just sink into the self-involvement. Let's talk about us, Nick. Let's do it, Let's baby. talk about us. Let's talk about our success. Let's talk about how we do things. Yeah, so, so one of the first things, I don't know if I'm going to do a blooper reel, but I might take a little, I might, I might steal that from you, put a little blooper reel at the, uh, the back end 20 minutes of this conversation. One of the first things Matt said to me when we got on the call this morning is that, you know, you know how I would rearrange your studio right now? The first thing I would do is take out the big orange thumb in the background and put a fat picture of my own face right back there. That was one of the first things Matt said. Um, so when he says, let's says talk the about guy us, flanked by caricature drawings of himself. <laughs> exactly. So when he says he's excited to talk about us, uh, he is in no way joking. But this is going to be a serious conversation in which I think y'all can get a lot of value from it. So if you do, make sure that you are following Matt on Twitter. Make sure that you are following myself and uh, just hit the thumbs up button if you find it enjoyable, valuable. Make sure you share it with friends, whatever. All that stuff will be linked in the description and down below. So Matt, as someone who has worked his way through the fantasy industry for years and has built a, a reputation and has built a reputation as a very solid source for um, analysis in the industry. Let's, let's take a step back and kind of learn where you came from. A couple of years ago, I actually heard you on a podcast. I don't know what it was, but it was similar to this topic about how you kind of came up and how you built Player Profiler um, and, and how you made your way kind of to where you are now. So give us a little bit of backstory about your history in the fantasy football industry and how you got to where you are today. I would love to. Uh, <laughs> I, we know. I was a big fantasy baseball player, so my, my friend in college went to study abroad, and he said, I'm not going to be able to pay much attention to what's going on in baseball from Germany or wherever he was, and I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll take your team over. That's not a problem, 
and then I and then we won the championship, uh, and I forced him to basically you know, acknowledge me as the <laughs> as the you know the the mastermind behind the championship. And then after that, I, I joined his league, and you know, in many championships later, I I started entering some fantasy football leagues, and it was just it was just very clear. I, I was also a big fan of Michael Lewis, so I had read Moneyball, and then right after that, I read The Blind Side, and it was just so striking to be in the fantasy football world and in the fantasy baseball world and read about the actual, you know, management of football teams and player personnel in the respective sports and just how different they were and, and how there was this trajectory. It was already happening in baseball. Advanced metrics and analytics was the focus and, and it sort of culminated with the Astros and then and they've since, you know, been revealed as, <laughs> as frauds. Yep. Uh, but Football just, it was clear, was willfully ignorant of a lot of numbers and a, a lot of you know, advanced, not only statistics, but you know, processes just analyzing information that could help teams, that could help with player personnel acquisition, that could help with play calling. So in-game tactics, everything, everything. In fact, there were heads of analytics for NFL teams. And you know what they did? They studied ticket prices. So the only analytics groups for NFL franchises, this was, you know, five years ago. This wasn't even that long ago. They were just focused on maximizing ticket revenue. They weren't looking at any other aspects of the organization. So I'm diving into football. I'm trying to get as good at football as I was at baseball. And I was exploring the, you know, whatever the equivalent in, in football is of OPS and war. And, you know, there was a site called fan graphs. There is a site called fan graphs in, in baseball. And, and I wanted an equivalent of fan graphs for football and it, it just didn't exist. So I decided, well, this thing should exist, but I didn't really have the means to, to launch a, a, a you know, whole enterprise a web platform, certainly wasn't thinking about podcasting or anything like that. And then something super serendipitous happened to me. I was working at a web design company and, you know, we work with different brands, all different types of brands, whether it be, you know, a perfume brand, a lifestyle brand, technology companies, all kinds. Were you actually a, a design, uh, someone that designed at the company? No, I was working in business development. So my whole background leading up to that point was software, software sales, but I had to started moving into the user experience, consulting, user experience, uh, uh, sort of uh, in, in product management guidance at the software company I was previously, and then at this new web design company where I was the one working with clients to design the whole experience for the user online, as well as, you know, pitch them the most products and services that we could possibly offer them. So it was really this hybrid product management and sales role that I had created for myself at a, a couple different companies I had worked for. So I was noticing at the time, so many of these companies we were working for, they kept asking us for these Facebook ads for social media. And that it was, it was a big thing. They wanted to start selling their products and services on social media, specifically Facebook. So we were inundated with these requests for all these custom Facebook ads. And it really was this aha moment where I looked at Facebook and I said, oh, this is different. They're starting to open up their API so brands can understand how to target ads to specific segments of their audience, how to change the ads based on the segment that they're reaching. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this was a revolution in advertising that for the first time, instead of everyone seeing the same ad on television, it was going to be an ad that was much more personalized to their demographics that were being available or made available on Facebook. More data was available via the API back then pre Cambridge Analytica right. and some of these controversies. This was more the wild west of social media. So I also had a stock portfolio and I looked up Facebook and it had IPO'd at like 45 and it was down to like 20. And I, I just, I was like, I felt like, wait, okay. So I'm hearing from all these buyers across corporate America that they're 
diverting a lot of their ad spend now to Facebook. And somehow this hasn't been reflected yet in the stock. So I decided, hey, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go all in. I'm still young, right? So sort of you know, a portfolio management strategy depends on your age. As you get older, you need to focus on less risky investments. But as long as you're young, if you're in your 20s or early 30s, you should be aggressive with your portfolio. This what is year the time. Was this, in? this was 2013. Okay. So 2013, I noticed that you know Facebook seems to have a lot of upside. You know, like uh, like Miles Sanders no, or hey, Chris no, Godwin. Hey, no player analysis. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> what? No, Not even an analogy? There will no. There will be no Miles Sanders. Oh, talk. There will be no Chris damn Godwin. it! I'm gonna I'm gonna beep that out. I'm gonna edit that out. Thank God for editing software. Oh, fuck. okay. I gotta find. I, yeah, you're God, you're gonna yeah. be. Struggling. What am I gonna do, man? You're I can't. I can't even use football players as as reference points. Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> so I decided, hey, you know what? I, I, I kind of go all in on this whole Facebook thing. I even bought options, which I, I don't recommend doing this, but this is the one case. And I'd also recently read a book by Peter Lynch, who started the Fidelity Magellan Fund in the 80s, and he really popularized the whole concept of mutual funds. And he had a book, he wrote a book, a famous book called One Up on Wall Street. And in it, he talks about how you can beat the market without having a lot of significant expertise. And there are, are two ways that you can, that he, he recommends investing. You invest in things you know, right? So you don't invest in, you know, pharmaceutical stocks. So you have no idea what's going on with those companies or what those products actually do or how they work. And use your expertise in your field. So if you are noticing at your company, that your company is starting to buy a lot of products for a particular supplier, Look into that supplier and what they're doing right, and maybe there's some value there. So this was what I was doing. I was leveraging this market intelligence I had at my particular perch at this particular company at a very particular moment in time in the industry. So I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make a big bet here. I'm going to buy some stock. I'm going to buy some options. They were deep out of the money options, so there's a lot of upside. And then six months later, I had turned $6,500 into $65,000. I cash, yes, this happened. And it was, so, yes, it would, yeah, of course there was some luck involved, right? It, it was lucky that the stock happened to be so underpriced. I don't know why it was, but it was. And, but I also have to give myself credit for recognizing it and then making the risk, taking a risk. I certainly didn't tell my wife. <laughs> right. I didn't tell my wife what was going on. And to this day, my uh, investment accounts are, are only, only, I only have access to, there's no one else has my password. It's not shared with any kind of advisor or my wife. No one knows what I'm doing in my investment accounts. I don't need those problems. And I need to be able to move money to places where I could exploit opportunities. This was one of those things. So it's another recommendation for anyone that's married. Don't just join everything right away right? It's a negotiation. So I took that money and I said, I don't really want to do this whole thing anymore. Just constantly pitching and constantly, you know, uh, working on behalf of others to optimize their websites or, or their landing pages or, or whatever it was. And I knew that this website, the fan graphs for football needed to be done. So I, I said, you know what, we're going to go ahead and launch it. And the thing that was new and different about what we did at the time was because I had this nest egg of money, I was able to commission a proper web design and development agency using, you know, I, I knew a lot of people in the business and I, I knew the types of uh, skill sets I was looking for and I knew uh, how to negotiate the like what, what things should cost if you're going to build a website from scratch so i had some advantages there with my background and i commissioned a website that would look like a professional modern website because at the time when you would see new websites be launched they would be either very rudimentary looking it would almost be like it was to the point where you were seeing uh, people just sharing Google Docs, Google Sheets, <laughs> yeah. you know, just to just to get their data out into the world. 
And I said, I, I don't want to do that. And I, and I don't want to use one of these very limited at the time, you know, Wix and, and website builders, like we're not nearly as sophisticated right. and we're going to have a lot of data. Right. And so I said, well, th there's, there's not a lot of great options for me to just get this data out and, and up on the internet. I need a, a web design company that actually knows what they're doing. Uh, and, and, and if people do a big query of the data, it's not going to crash. Um, so I invested a lot in the user experience and from the beginning, I, that was the, the compliment that we would get that I was always the most proud of because that stretches all the way back to my initial investment and the launch of the business, which was, I want this to be a fun and engaging user experience. I don't want anyone to feel like it's work to go pull these numbers. That's, so that's yeah. kind of how it all started. That was that the makes idea. So much sense because I even on the show sheet I I uh, wrote over I was like let's talk about your website because it's so aesthetically well done and going back to your history you have done this for years so you know you know you knew what it would take you knew the people you already had the resources you had um, the network to get it done so it's I mean all all that makes sense I do uh, wonder like as someone you created a product or a service, a website, because you saw a gap in the marketplace. Uh, for who you are right now, like you have experience in, in marketing, you have experience in UX, you have experience in this website design stuff. Um, so you have a lot of experience in a lot of different fields. You as a person right now, if someone were to say, are you a, and gave you multiple choice answers, are you a businessman? Are you a business owner? Are you a podcaster? Are you an entrepreneur? Are you just someone that's, you know, passionate about what you're doing and kind of just took a path that led you down a million different ways? Like, how would you describe yourself right now? I am a, uh, a data connoisseur that runs a web platform. Okay. You know, I, I run a, a, a sports media platform. That's what I do. Um, and I, I don't like to be um, classified only as a fantasy football person mm -hmm. because a lot of people that use playerprofiler.com are not interested in fantasy football. There are scouts and general managers of NFL teams that use playerprofiler.com. So you know that in that fact. way, yeah, in that way, we, we know when we list our competitors, the first competitor is Pro Football Focus. That's really the, the site that, that we are sort of most aligned with in the marketplace in terms of where we fit into the sector. Uh, and, and I think of myself as first and foremost a, a sports media guy. That's really what I am and with a focus on football. And a lot of people don't fully appreciate how incredibly dominant the sport of football is in the United States. And because the United States is, is, is so, such a dominant presence on the web, just how dominant the NFL is as a presence. So we are currently only NFL. And I get asked, well, when are you guys going to launch a basketball site? When are you guys going to launch a soccer site? And I can tell you, we have the specs. I have the specs in my hand right here. Well, not right here, but <laughs> over there, I have the specs. They're on the computer. Okay. So I have the specs for, for a basketball site. And I know want, exactly what to, to I that. know exactly what I want to build. I know exactly where the data is going to come from, how we're going to get it, how it would be presented, everything. I, I know how to monetize it. Like it, it's all there, but we have a certain amount of revenue that we are able to spend back into the business and, and reinvest in the business. And when we have to go and make that decision, the problem with these other sports is they don't have a fraction of the, the visibility of the audience of the fan base that the NFL has, especially in the United States. So every time I run the numbers, I, as a, in this case, a business person, it, I'm incentivized to continue to invest on the football side of the business. So at some point, we're just going to have to, as a charitable endeavor, pretty much, do other sports. Just because we want to be a multi-sport enterprise, it's going to happen. I promise all of you basketball fans, it's going to happen. But for the time being, you're just going to see more and more football content and tools from us.
That's because that's where the audience is and that's how we can affect the most people. But you don't think starting, so, so you, you consider yourself a, a, a data guy, which is super interesting because I think most people who start creating content in the fantasy football space do it because they're obsessed with football or um, obsessed with fantasy football. And some of them do multiple sports and some of them do actually create content for multiple sports, which is for me is like talking a different language, but it seems like you're, you're just following the data. So um, maybe you're not as passionate about football per se, as you are like uh, the data side of things, the business side of things. Um, obviously you are extremely passionate about football because you go. I've been around the people that are maximum passionate about football. Mm -hmm. I'm not that guy. Okay. I, I never was that guy. Like I said, I got started in fantasy baseball. I have grown to love the NFL and appreciate it for what it is, this gladiator spectacle, which I'll always be conflicted about because I've read a lot and I've, I've consumed a lot of information about the dark side of the NFL. Uh, you know, it, 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 even if you just watch HBO Real Sports. Oh, it's coming. Right? HBO it's Real coming. Sports. <laughs> Bryant Gumbel is not a fan of the NFL. <laughs> and you can tell whoever has editorial control over there at HBO Real Sports, it has no interest in making the NFL look good. So if you want to see the other side of it, you just watch that show for a season and they'll have a couple segments on the darker side of the NFL. So I, I, I see it for what it is, but there is something special about this warrior culture that we have in, 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 in this current society, which is super coddled and super convenient and super comfortable. What these guys are doing in the NFL is something like was going on in America 200 years ago. Yeah. And there's something, there's something super uh, visceral about the sport. And, and that is actually something that I, I didn't have that coming in. And so I've actually learned to appreciate the sport even more as someone who has, you know, built an enterprise around it. So I really, I really did come in through the back door with my passion for the sport, but I'm never going to be that guy that's listening to five football podcasts a day, is watching all the games, you know, is on NFL Rewind. You know, I, I just, I, I'm never going to be at that place. And I, I've never claimed to be that guy. Yeah, I can relate to that on, on, on a ton of levels because my passion is stuff like this as well. Like I love um, branding and marketing. It was my background as well before I got into like the whole content creation piece. So when I tell people that I'm not, you know, I tell people in five years, I might not be putting out any content relevant to football or fantasy football. And most people don't believe me or probably take that as a joke because that's the main portion of what it is. But realistically, I've just found myself as being a, a pretty good communicator and have been able to build leverage and a platform based around fantasy football because I definitely am passionate about it. I think the reason I started creating content in the first place was because I genuinely was like, I could help people with fantasy football. This was when I was much younger, like, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And as I've grown as a person and as my interests have grown, I've, you know, levitated more towards this side of, of things like the marketing and business side of things. And football is my gateway to be able to practice business and, and marketing and things like that. And as you said, built an enterprise um, around it. So yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting hearing that coming from other content creators because you never, you, you hear the passion from people, but that's, that's the personal passion. You know, it's not always based around the content itself because if I were to listen to one podcast from you, I would be like, wow, this guy is, is nuts over football. But when you dig a little deeper, you you hear it's it's the data, it's the football mixed in with the data. It's the person as a passionate person that um, loves it's the what culture he's doing too. The football culture is really there's a portal into a lot of what I love about American life, a lot about what I love about interpersonal relations, mm -hmm. uh, the, the evolution of our society. It's it's a real it's a real window into what's good and what's bad about people and th there's just there's just it, it's just a w it's just very fertile ground for mining all of these things whether it's you know psychological effects exploring human bias you know 
whether, you know, how coaches are covered do versus you find offensive yourself, linemen. Do you find yourself There's just reverse. so many things that are interesting about uh, that. And football is really just a vehicle for us to talk about these interesting aspects of humanity. That's yeah. Do you find yourself reverse engineering a lot of things um, in your, in your life in a sense now, because I, you know, at this point I kind of set goals for myself and most of them are not anything football related, but since I've built the platform around football, I set the goal and then I figure out what I need football wise in order to like achieve it, whether it's from a business sense or a money sense or whatever. And it seems like you have a lot of interests that are aligned with football, but not necessarily like football centric. You know what I mean? It's not purposeful that I would reverse engineer, but what'll happen is I'll read a book, uh, you know, a book on psychology or a a book on uh, history or something. And then I'll notice parallels because I'm knee deep in football all day. And then those, that mesh point becomes a topic on a podcast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I always, you know, you're always diving into content that is again, mesh with football, but brings in other passions of yours, which is why I think you've built a brand like really, really creatively and successfully. Cause not a lot of people have, it, it's a fine line to walk to have your audience be intrigued by what you're talking about, because you have to be passionate about both things that you're offering. And in a sense, like when, just to give an example from my side as well, <clears throat> you know, I talk about, um, how, I, how, how I'm very passionate about marketing and business and stuff. And this is exactly an example of that. So I could see myself in five or seven years, like I would love to work with um, maybe younger kids who also want to start their own business or their own um, content creation thing, right? And this is an avenue. uh, This is almost like me not really paying attention to it, but reverse engineering that. Like I want to get there. How do I make football and business work together? And conversations like this, I think is how you put yourself out there. So I think of these things like, very, I, I'm, I'm a big reverse engineer. Like I think of the long-term goals and I'm like, how do I get that using the leverage that I have at this moment? And at the end of the day, Nick, it's for the kids. It's for the kids, yes, baby. I it's love always this. for the, for the kids, man. That's what we do. It. It's for the Stay kids. away from China, kids. Stay in America, please. As long as you can um, disregard that last comment. Okay. So let's get back to playerprofiler.com. Now, when you're doing any sort of like creative endeavor. It's great. There's a lot of passion behind it. You get to express yourself artistically or through your data, however you express yourself. However, there needs to be some money involved. The monetization is what keeps those dreams alive. It lets you open up time and freedom to chase those dreams that you have and the passions that you have. Now on your site, you are a subscription service. You offer uh, a once a year subscription that un- unlocks your rankings, among other things. You also sell some side products and you're on Patreon as well. So kind of wanted to dive into your mindset behind making a subscription uh, service. Why you decided to do that instead of just sell all individual products? Is it just easier to do it that way? Is it more automated? Is that the thought behind it? I'm sure you have some numbers that you've crunched. <clears throat> well, we, we want to make money. Uh, but I want to have, but I feel like I, I want to launch a subscription service. This was about three years ago that was principled. So I, I didn't want to arbitrarily decide, okay, this is going to be behind a paywall. This is not going to be behind a paywall. So I, I, I thought long and hard about this. This was something that, that I, I, I put as much thought into as anything that, that I've done with, with Roto Underworld and Player Profiler. And where I came down is this. I want to make all this data free to everybody on players. I want you to be online. I want you to type in... Cri- Stop. I'll uh, let you do it. You could say it. Go. Uh, 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 cr- 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 Craig Chris Godwin. Chris Godwin. Bladwin. Okay. You, I want you to type in Craig Blodwin. I'm going to see on what Google. Comes up. Craig Blodwin metrics. You can't bleep that out. Craig I didn't. Blodwin. I didn't say a football player's name. Craig Blodwin's na- name. Craig Blodwin plus metrics. I got a. I got bad That's. news for you. Your player profiler doesn't pop up when you type in Craig Blodwin. Bingo. Okay, but any football uh, f ball player and metrics or stats. And what you get is free. 
right? That way, Google can index the whole thing and make it searchable. And that, therefore, we as a brand are easy to find. And all these other aspects of the site, whether it be all the in-depth content and analysis in the articles, uh, the podcast, make that free to everybody, uh, the depth charts. So everything which is sort of core information and analysis free. And then if you like that and you want to go to the next level and you either want access to sophisticated tools that require processing power, like data analysis, download all this data, sort it, filter it. If you are a, a more advanced power user of our data, well, then you're using it at a level that others are not. And it's only fair that you would pay. And also, it's, it's more likely you're willing to pay. The other area of the site are like our rankings. And, and that is very time consuming to put together because really yep. you're getting a window into my brain. So when it comes to things like the rankings or our, our draft kit and our draft kit cheat sheet, you're getting a window into my brain or a handful of our experts' brains, or you're really deciding to, to, to ramp up the horsepower that you need or, or want to utilize with the site. If the content that you're consuming falls into either of those buckets, I believe that I would consider you a power user. You want to take it to the next level, and it's fair that you would pay, and coincidentally, you're probably a person that's willing to pay. So that's where we decided the line would be, the threshold would be that if you want to go above this, you're going to enter an area that is premium and that you would pay a yearly fee to access. So that's the primary lever that, that we've pulled for monetization on the site. You'll notice that there are no banner ads. So one of the aspects of the site that we have maintained is 100% control of every pixel of the site is controlled by me. So I'm a little bit obsessed with control. No, it's beautiful. I think I actually tweeted this out like two weeks ago. I think it's fucking mind blowing that in 2020, there are still websites in which you need to disable your ad blocker to read articles and they have ads and banner ads. And I'm like, yo, I cannot believe there's business models out there to this day. All that is, is putting the consumer, the audience a roadblock away from actually getting to your content. Like it's yeah, such a And then these people model. complain Dude. when Google punishes them. Facts. When they fall in the Google ranks, they complain. Why are you complaining? If you click on a link to that article from Google, I get blocked from being able to access the page. It's all grayed out. It's all pixelated until I pay or I put in my email address. So of course, eventually Google is going to do what's best for their consumers and push your content down and push our content up. It's yep. why our hits continue to explode because we are catering to the customers of Google who want instant access to information without any bullshit. Business tip 101 right now. You can't be mad when Google changes the rules so that their customers have a better experience. You, that's why Google's so fucking successful because they keep the customer You don't mind. think they want to stay on top, Nick? Yes, the, you got to keep the customer in mind as a content creator, as a business owner, as fucking Google, as any company, your first, second, third, fourth priority should be your audience and your consumer and your customer. It should not, if your model in any way, your business like monetization model interferes with the consumption of your content, then you're doing it wrong. You need to go back to the drawing board. So I- Yeah, uh, if, if it feels like a gimmick, right? don't do it. Exactly. Just Don't do you know, it. No, you know deep down. You're like, ah, am I doing this You know this if the it's a gimmick. It's like, it's like porn. You know it when you see it. Exactly. If it's a web gimmick, you know it when you see it. So just, you, you don't have to do it. But we do have site sponsors and sure. we put them in strategically located positions with direct links to take action on football relevant games, contests, monkey knife fights, a great example. And they pay us a significant amount of money to be 
put in places where someone who would be a likely customer of Monkey Knife Fight can easily uh, you know, place a bet on a particular player when they're on that particular play, that particular player's page. Yeah. If we didn't have that level of content and personalization of our calls to action for our sponsors, if it was just some generic ad that was flashing in your face, you wouldn't have that same visceral experience using our site and you'll be less likely to bookmark it, less likely to come back. So one day we're going to ramp up the advertising on our site. Eventually, I can tell you this right now, and I'm sorry to, to, to our users, which, which you know, think that it's going to be utopia forever. Eventually, the money is going to be too good in the online advertising for us to say no. But they'll do but, that. But you'll do that through your content, not necessarily through the website. We'll, there will be ads on our website. Okay. We can't go forever being this like ideal of you know, zero don't, don't, don't ads on, on our man. website. I mean, it, 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 it's not, it's not possible, right? I mean, even, even like the greatest actors that you would think would never appear on a series or in a, uh, it, 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 didn't I, didn't I see that Paul Dano, Paul Dano, Paul Dano is going to be the Riddler. Okay. So if Paul Dano, I don't even know who that is. Paul Dano is, is, is an, you know, an auteur actor, right? Okay. He's in films. He's oh, a he film like a actor. He's a he could... serious actor, right? He was, he was the preacher in There Will Be Blood. Was he the dude in The Girl Next Door? His friend that does the porno? I don't know. Never mind. Never mind. I don't know, but he's a serious actor. He's in serious films, and he's going to be in a superhero movie. And you just have to deal with it. Joaquin Phoenix was just in a superhero movie. So it's going to happen, guys. Okay, fair. We're, we're going to have an ad somewhere on the site at some point because eventually the, 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 the dollars will just be so that I, I, I'm doing the entire enterprise a disservice by not accepting this, this money that I can reinvest into bigger and better tools or apps. Right now, our priority are football apps. Because we launched our Dynasty Dominator app for Dynasty. And you said that, you know, you've been uh, consuming uh, some of our Dynasty content. And it's helping you as a Dynasty player. And we feel like that is a great opportunity because the beauty of Dynasty is it's engaging all year round. The problem that so many of us have in fantasy football is it's very seasonal. And it's devastating when your listeners and your subscribers drop off the planet in January. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is demoralizing. Everyone feels this way, right? From Matthew Barry to you, to me, everybody. Uh, it's a demoralizing thing. And the, the beauty of Dynasty and why I, I've gravitated to it is that it's, it, there's a conversation happening all year round, right? whether it be the NFL draft, or whatever it is. And I am bending the will of our enterprise to cater more to the Dynasty Leaguer, even though... Those people don't number, right? And, and the demographics, if you're running numbers, like there's not as many of those people. Why would you cater to them? Those people are more valuable. 100%. Those people are going to spend more time on our site. Those people are going to see more ads. They're going to visit more sponsors. They're going to be more likely to sign up for something premium. They're going to be more likely to support me on Patreon. So that's why we cater to them. That's why, you know, in term, from, a, from a business standpoint, delineating your customers, putting them in buckets. You know, you don't have to get super granular, but at least put your customers in buckets so you can create a lifetime value for these different customer profiles. Again, could be three different profiles. You don't have to, you don't have, to have a roster of, of 20 different customer profiles. Yeah, demographics, genders, locations. But you need to understand who your valuable customers are and who your least valuable customers are and, and divide them up and make sure that you're, you're catering more to your most valuable customers and not just treating all your customers equally as just generic visitors or generic listeners. So because we're doing it that way, we've been devoting more of our resources, you know, in R and D to the dynasty leaguer and the dynasty dominator app with a trade analyzer and, and a price lookup and a player comparison tool came out last year, this year, we're investing in the Breakout Finder app. 
uh, which is basically a wide receiver focused uh, application, which brings in a bunch of new metrics and helps to create a breakout rating for wide receivers. And it, it's, it's an exciting project where we're probably going to be launching it in the next couple months. And I'm an addict. I love the app store. I love apps because we don't have to host them, right? Your mm -hmm. phone hosts the app. So it, it, it's a lot less technological uh, firepower that we need to deploy, right? It's less costly for us to, to build an app and put it in the app store as opposed to building an entire web infrastructure to support a new website. So we're going to have a breakoutfinder.com site as well with a premium subscription, but the app is coming out first. It's telling that we're launching the app before we launch the website. That that's, gives you some insight into how our priorities stack up and, and how we value these products. The app is provides the best possible returns for us with the lowest risk. And you just go into the app store and you click a button and it charges your iTunes account. You can't get better than that in terms of a sales funnel. It's just so easy and we can sell little add-ons within the app uh, and it, it's become a, a recurring source of revenue that, that is, requires the least amount of maintenance. And I love passive income. There's nothing I love more than passive income. And, and Nick can, can talk to this and speak to this, but that's, that's really the Valhalla moment for a content creator when you can just put something out there and just sit back and let it generate revenue with, without you constantly having to grind out every dollar. Yeah, I would say that um, there is obviously forms of passive income, but passive income only comes at the end of the run. Like in order for you to get to passive income, you have put so much work in on the front end to get to there. Like people, Beyond. people yeah, yeah, I mean, the investment is huge. It, it's, it's tens I mean, it, of thousands of dollars. Is that how much it, it takes to make the app? Absolutely. So the Dynasty Dominator app, we made 4X on it. So the initial investment uh, was you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars, but we, we just had so many subscribers, you know, many thousands of subscribers, because there aren't a lot of fantasy football tools in the app store. That's also, that's also it's an vacant. evergreen. I that's went there. I was looking. I was like, where are the apps? There's no apps. There's, there's apps to play fantasy football. So all the platforms, Yahoo and ESPN, they all have apps. But in terms of tools, it was strikingly vacant. And, and so now people search for fantasy football and, and it's, it's just there. It's right there for them. So I didn't know. I had no idea. I knew that I wanted an app. I knew that it needed to be done. It's kind of like the website initially. I knew that this thing needed to be done. It, it was just a, a gap in what was available in the marketplace for people, uh, the more advanced fantasy gamer like myself, to, to, you know, to, to quench that thirst for, for or data or an edge or however you want to think of it. And then the, the next frontier was, was the app store. And then the sales just blew away even our greatest expectations, our wildest expectations, and that, you know, reviewing the numbers, right? If you put your accounting hat on and you, and, and, and you put your, your, your finance hat on, you, okay, CFO. So I'm the only full-time employee. So I have all these different hats. I put on my CFO hat. I put on my operations hat and I put on my CFO hat and I'm like, well, our returns on investment for this app were the best. So why don't we just, uh, why don't we just do another app? That's that, how it happens. That's how that decision gets made. It, but also I love the app. I also love them. I love the apps. I love using the apps. And, and here's the, the final piece that I want to share with you and how I knew it was a good idea to build the app. When we were first doing it and I was doing, I had a demo, it's called test flight. Okay. It's called, that's the, that's the software for the iPhone. It's called test flight. And that's where you can test your new app before it goes in the app store. And I had it open and I left it open on my phone. 
And guess what happened on my, on my, just on the sideboard in our kitchen. Guess what happened? My eight year old daughter picked it up and started playing with it. And I looked over five minutes later, she was still playing with it, looking up prices on uh, dynasty values on players. And I looked over five minutes later, she was still playing with it. And I was like, okay, okay, this is good. Well, the, the beautiful thing about that app in particular is you've made a product that's, that's evergreen, you know, and that is an extremely difficult thing to make in our seasonal industry, right? Like I could make my draft guide, you'll buy it once this summer and then you'll never use it again. But like the investment that you made, you, you know, if you make 3X, 4X, 5X, that's just off the first year. Like that will continue to compile and your investment will be bigger and bigger and bigger because as Dynasty grows, this is probably the best trade, in my opinion, trade calculator out there right now or app or whatever. And there's different websites, like you said, but the, the idea of making an evergreen product for our industry is extremely difficult. And thankfully, Dynasty is gaining in popularity. So there will be more opportunities to create more evergreen stuff. But it's, it's almost like trying to find the fountain of youth right now. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult to uh, search for it. And you don't really know if you're ever going to find it. But it sounds like you have with this one. Um, the apps are interesting. Like I was well, it's, like with- you, it's like you said, though. There's no shortcut. Evergreen products and content and passive revenue like they sound good like yeah we, yeah. we like talking about them and, and yes they're great we can sit back and smoke cigars and and and, and watch the, the passive revenue come in but that's only after that's only after yeah. you writing a huge check and taking a big risk and every single day shepherding this product through its life cycle to become something that's actually usable and is not going to get all one stars in the app store and completely flame out. It's a lot of work. And, you know, like I said, stretching all the way back to that initial investment in Facebook at a, at an opportune time that kicked off my ability to do this. And I, I do recognize that I'm very lucky in that my wife has a, a job which allowed me to transition to this career. Um, if I were by myself, if I were a single dad, it wouldn't have been possible, right? So I have to always acknowledge the shoulders of the giants that I stood on to get here. Uh, and, and, and so it's all, it, it's all part of that, part of its execution, part of its hard work, part of its taking these risks, but part of it is, you know, the, the network of people that you have around you that I'll allow you to get to these places and I'll always be grateful for that. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, th- there's so much that goes in behind the scenes when you're thinking about these risks and stuff. And obviously, you know, we talk about making money, but on the other side of things, there are the risks that you take, as you've kind of mentioned and investing in things. Cause as they say, scared money, don't make no money. So you have to be able to put money into places particularly for marketing, particularly for advertising. And myself and Matt are in a very unique spot in which we can have a a unique conversation about this um, because the upcoming season, myself and Matt will be working together on an advertising level. And I wanted to open up the talks that we had prior because Matt had reached out to me via email a few weeks ago. Um, He was like, you know, uh, you you had a big uh, year last year. Um, I think we can possibly collab on something and work together and, you know, swap off on each other's podcasts and whatnot. And I was like super excited because, you know, you could tell from the intro of this podcast alone that I'm a, I'm a big fan of Matt and I'm a big fan of his work and his, his work ethic and the, the stuff that he's been able to put out into the world. So I was, you know, ecstatic when I got the email from him. So we got on a Skype call. Uh, last week or two weeks ago or whatever, just to, you know, start preliminary discussions because we had never talked like face to face and to kind of get to know each other a little bit more. Um, so Matt had the idea of using my platform, the, the audience that I've built on YouTube and attempt to funnel them over to playerprofiler.com. So he wants to be a sponsor for my channel in this upcoming summer. And, uh, you know, depending on how deep we'll, we'll get into the negotiations, I kind of wanted to get your mindset on why you thought my channel was good. And when we originally talked, I know um, you you guys are an advanced metric website, right? So it's a little bit more advanced for the normal fantasy football player 
advanced. Ad- advanced, correct. A little we bit more advanced. advanced for the normal football player. So he wants to bridge the gap between the season-long guys, which is a, a large part of my audience. And I believe you use the term like drive-by fantasy consumers in a sense because a lot of my engagement, a lot of my growth for my channel personally happens between – Uh, the end of August through early September when people are preparing for their season long fantasy drafts. So his idea, I believe was, you know, if you can promote my website, my advanced metrics to these season long guys and show them that, you know, it's easy to work with. It's easy to, uh, you know, kind of eat and, and, and be able to spit out information that is valuable and easily consumable, then we can get some of those drive by fantasy guys and convert them into more advanced metric people. So Matt, I kind of wanted to, you know, get your thought process on, on why specifically uh, my channel you thought was a good fit for. I don't know why you're even asking me. Now you just stole my entire, uh, uh, all my talking points for this particular section. You sent me the show sheet. I knew we were going to talk about this. I had my thoughts together and, and you just, you, you just sort of, uh, you know, subverted everything I wanted to say. Thanks for that, Nick. I appreciate that summary of everything I was about to say. That's a huge compliment because I rarely, <laughs> I rarely ever hear you uh, out of things to say. So thank no, you for that. It's, it's not a show where I'm not criticizing someone for how they navigated the show sheet, <laughs> whether it was you know stealing my answer or, or giving away, spoiler alerting something. Uh, I, I, this, I love the, the behind the scenes. Nothing I love more than the behind the scenes and the show mechanics. I, I always want your big show the listener to feel like they have access to behind the scenes, whether it be with outtakes, whether it be with just breaking character and letting everybody know, hey, this isn't serious. I always want every show to have a wink and a nod to let the audience know I don't take this seriously. I don't take myself seriously this is fun. This is sports. This is a game that's played on top of yet another game. That's what fantasy football is. It's a game inside a game. So hell if I'm going to be self-serious about it. Okay. And so even if I on. am self-serious, you know, at, at, in a particular moment of the show, it's also important that the audience know that in, you know, bigger picture, I'm not taking this all very seriously. Okay, I stole your thunder, but let me let but me. No, 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 but but no, but I no, I have I have I thoughts. I actually want to. I actually would love to uh, zoom out a little bit okay. and tell the audience how I first stumbled upon you. So it, it was really, I, I I sort of believe in the universe sending you signals, and so the idea that I would stumble upon your show on YouTube that it would be just queued up right after my show. So that right there, YouTube, when we talk about the, the, the Google algorithm, mm-hmm. no shit, it's pretty smart. Those people over at Google, they have some smart people, right? Yeah, guess They're what? They're trying YouTube. to do right by, by people searching for things. Mm-hmm. Well, YouTube is owned by Google, and I know some people over at, at YouTube, and, and they're pretty smart, and, and they're trying their best to make sure that people that are watching and listening are getting what they they want. I hate, I hate going to YouTube to do work and then st- somehow 10 minutes in. have gone by and I'm watching a Norm McDonald joke on <laughs> Conan O'Brien. And I'm like, wait, what am I doing? I'm supposed to be productive. I, I came back, here Matt. to change my YouTube channel to optimize, you know, whatever. And then I just blew 10 minutes watching Norm McDonald. Thanks, YouTube. Always knowing what I want to see and what's relevant. Anyway. So at that... A- anyway. The, the <laughs> same day yeah. that someone uh, mentions your show and that I should go on your show or I should reach out to you and have you on my show, I also stumbled upon your show on YouTube. And I was like, this is just this, too, this confluence of events. This is not a coincidence. And then I, I go to your site and you reference our website. And I noticed you have a hell of a lot of listeners and a hell of a lot of viewers. And it all just clicks together. And I realized that this, the audience that you have, your demographic is, you know, pretty much in a separate concentric circle from my audience. So what happens is 
a lot of people in my audience, they end up finding our website after they've iterated over and cycled through everything else that's out there. So it's really this, this climb, right, to finally get to like the most advanced metrics, the, mo the place where the most advanced metrics are easily available. I think that's what you would consider my site, right? Playerprofiler.com. Right, okay. But uh, the first year you play fantasy, you're not going to go there. You would never stumble upon our site the first year you play fantasy, right? It would be after a, a bunch of years go by, either uh, building on success or, or, or trying to get better because you're frustrated that you're not winning your fantasy football league and you start taking it more seriously and you start exploring, you know, uh, data sources. And eventually, yeah, eventually you end up on playerprofiler.com. We feel like in the, you know, football data world, you know, especially geared data geared to fantasy footballers, you know, we're at the top of the food chain, but it takes time to get there for a lot of, uh, members of our audience and a lot of our users. And I noticed that the way you were talking to people, it was a very inviting show. And I put myself in the shoes of someone who, again, this is the elusive fantasy gamer that rarely finds us, at least not for a couple of years. And I would go to YouTube and I would type in, you know, fantasy football mock draft and guess what would come up first? Well, God damn it, the big dog eats mock draft, <laughs> Big dog eats. right? With <laughs> there's a G, ben, there's a G, what? big dog's got to eat. Woof. Oh, oh, many, 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 many apologies, Nick. It's okay. Big All dog's got to eat podcast or in this particular case, uh, your YouTube channel featured. So, film. Feature, yes, a film with starring Paul Dano. <laughs> so, <laughs> I drink your milkshake. I have always wondered, like, what you look like when you go nuts behind the scenes. Because I listen to your podcast always, and you're always going nuts. And I'm like, he can't really be this animated when you watch him, but it does not fucking disappoint. Oh, there will be blood. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Incredible. So, yeah, Paul Dano it had an incredible performance in that movie, but it just overshadowed by the GOAT. DDL, as we call it. Just like, you know, BDGE, Daniel Day-Lewis. Big right? Dog's got a Daniel Day-Lewis. I love it. Yes, Big thinking Dog's of, got a Daniel Day-Lewis. All right, what go back to where you were. What was I talking were. about, Nick? Uh, I forget, to be honest. I forgot. So, I stumble upon you know, your mock draft show, and I, I realize – Oh, this is, this is a portal for anyone that starts to think about taking their fantasy gaming to the next level. You're speaking to those people in a way that I don't have access to. I just don't. It's a, it's a blind spot in my audience. It's a gap that I know that our entire enterprise has. And almost like a key turning in a lock, I saw and found your... Uh, entire brand and it, you know it was just basically like a little it was an earworm it, it, it nestled in there it was during the season or maybe even last summer I don't remember exactly when it was but I knew we had to talk and then as soon as, soon as the football season was, it was over I emailed you and I said listen we should set something up where the 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 person who's just starting to take fantasy football more seriously I, we wa I want to teleport them a couple years in, in, in their evolution as a fantasy gamer straight to playerprofiler.com so we don't have to wait. I just wanted to press the fast forward button and get them to us faster. So that was my goal and that's why I think that it, it's, it's a, the, really the perfect partnership. But like I talked about with online advertising, it's not going to be this stilted, oh, and let's have a, a word from playerprofiler.com. So playerprofiler.com is a great place where you get stats. No, it's just whenever it's natural and you're talking about a particular player and a particular metric that we happen to have on our site, I want to make sure that you have all the information about a particular tool or a particular functionality 
that you can share with your audience and, and streamline that process of them getting to know us and also not feeling like it's too advanced, right? Advanced, advanced. Like I want, my goal also is you do a great job of, of, you know, engaging your audience. And I think that you will be great at showing them, Hey guys, <laughs> this isn't a big deal. Now, this isn't rocket surgery. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the thing. That's the thing. And I think we'll introduce the entire platform to a group of people that didn't know that they wanted or needed advanced metrics on football players in their life, but God damn it, they will, uh, you know, once they've listened to a couple of your shows this summer. Yes. Enter stage left, big dogs eat. That's where we come in. We bridge the gap. That is, that is very smart marketing. I want to touch on this, uh, a few different topics. One, like you talk about fitting things in naturally. Another thing that blows my mind outside of banner ads and websites is the fact that a lot of companies use a lot of money through podcasting, through YouTube, through whatever. And they have these content creators with like zero passion behind what they're pitching and zero, like, you know, the, the reads in the beginning of the episode or the fake reads in the middle of the episode. Like I can't imagine that stuff makes anybody any money. You're someone on the flip side who, you know, the companies that you work with, you named Monkey Knife Fight. Shout out to the guys at Monkey Knife Fight. Zach, I see you. You, got, you do a great job of integrating that stuff into your content extremely naturally. Like it doesn't go off flow. You're talking about guys that you think are uh, ready for touchdown regression or progression or whatever. And you're like, that's why it's a great time to invest on them on Monkey Knife Fight, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you could learn a lot from listening to Matt as any type of content creator, any type of industry, how to naturally fit that stuff in there. I think it's something that companies and brands need to do a better job of actually looking into the people that they're investing in. And to touch back on, um, you know, investing. Yeah. In and, and, and listen, if you hadn't already had a, had an affinity for the site, we wouldn't be talking. Exactly. And that's just smart marketing by you. That's good business by you. Right. Yeah. You, you, I, I know that that tells me it's a fit. That's a litmus test. It's smart marketing. You looked at it from such a bird's eye view of like, this is, this is what I am. This is what he is. This is how we're going to bridge the gap. Cause most companies, not only do they pick people who don't read well, not literally read well, but you know, passionately, but they, they, all they do is look at views or numbers and they're like, okay, they have a lot of eyeballs, but they don't know if those eyeballs are the right fit for their company. So the way I yeah, think we don't, I don't, I don't want to market to a redundant audience. No, of course not. So you did, I think you had a lot of points within the negotiation that made a lot of sense for us to partner. Um, and I, I want to actually break, I, you know, I also don't have a lot of money, right? We are a very small business, right? Uh, Mr. Mr. Facebook I, stocks over here. Well, I mean, <laughs> we know I, 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 that money's gone, man. I, I, I risked it all, baby. I risked it all. It won. So, and, but you know, compared to, you know, a, a larger business, you know, it's not like I have a, a big ad budget or anything like that. I don't have a, have a big marketing budget. It's like, you know, maybe a, a, this show, uh, the, the big dogs gotta eat. There we go. And the uh, Google ads, very limited. Like it's a lean startup business that I'm running here. And so I also have to be smart. I, don't, I can't afford not to be. Yeah. And I, uh, no, I, I respect that. And I appreciate it. I think it was one of the reasons I wanted to work with you. I kind of want to dive into the actual numbers if you're okay with that. Sure. Okay. So in terms of money, right? Uh, the way content creators work with advertisers or sponsors can work in a, in a few different ways. I've talked about this on a lot of my vlogs and stuff. You could work with partners on an affiliate basis where they give you, you know, some kind of special promo code. And every time someone signs up and uses your promo code, you get a kickback from that. Um, you could do it on a sponsorship basis where you work on a CPM basis, which is cost per a thousand views or cost per a thousand listens. Uh, you could, you know, market at $20, $30, $10, whatever it is. And based on you could, you could guarantee views or downloads upfront and say, we'll guarantee you, you know, 20,000 views and you just pay upfront based on that. And anything that comes extra is just part of the deal. You could have like a 30 day look back window and say, we're going to look back 30 days after I release the video and base it on a $15 CPM or whatever. So when me and Matt were kind of calculating numbers, we were just doing it on the spot. 
And Matt had a number that he came to me that he wanted to hit. It was $7,500. And based off of a six month span, he wanted to do one video sponsorship a week, which ends up being I don't, 26 shows or whatever from like July through December. And admittedly, I knew that we were going to grow this summer. We're going to see more views. We're going to get more listens on the podcast. Um, and being someone who you know has both angles, it's it just kind of compiled onto each other. So we did the math kind of over the phone, and it broke down to like a fifteen or fourteen dollars CPM. At this point, as a content creator, and I don't mean this to come off in a narcissistic way to the audience, but I realize I have a lot of leverage because the brands that want to reach my audience have to get through me first. So typically, I would say, you know, no, that's that's too low of a price for me. But what you value as a content creator, as a business person, can take the place of money sometimes. So originally, when Matt told me the number that he wanted to hit, I was hesitant and I would have came back with a different price. But Matt being the person that he is, I put the value of building a relationship with Matt because he's someone in the industry that I would like to work with over the long term, over an extra $500,000, $2,000, whatever it was, uh, over that money. So we ended up coming down with the deal for 75 over the six month span, which might sound like a lot of money for just a, you know, a kid that lives in, in an apartment in New York and just creates fantasy football um, content. But for a lot of bigger content creators, they get ridiculous deals when it comes to sponsorships and advertisers. So the point being is make sure that if you are negotiating or if you're just interested in the topic, it's like you have to understand what you value. And again, I, I say this, I echo it, that I value the relationship with Matt I, I like the work that he puts out. I love the resources that he makes avail available to the community. And that was something that I put as a kind of side piece to the deal and was willing to take less money to work with Matt. Thank you for doing that. Um, I feel like I got a great deal because I, it, this is very much like we talked about earlier, you know, picking stocks. I believe that you are prime for a big year of growth. And I wanted to make sure that we talked in January so that I could place my bet as early as possible. And that ideally, you get to lock in a sponsor so you can already tell everybody, hey, listen, I already have sponsors locked in, mm -hmm. right? So that's a value, right? So I'm first in the door. It's just like an angel investor, but you think of it in a year of advertising. It's however you want to think of it. Um, and so I feel like I'm going to get a great return because I feel like your show is going to grow and I want to get paid in terms of value, in terms of just getting a, 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 ultimately if your show grows more than expectation, what I ultimately pay by locking in a flat rate will be a lower CPM mm -hmm. and we're all happy. You're promoting something that you were pseudo promoting already. I'm reaching an audience that has been elusive to me and we get to join forces in a way that I think just makes sense, right? So you're always looking for partners that share your sensibilities that you, where you can help grow together. You see this across the industry, right? So uh, I think an example of that would be the fantasy footballers working with pristine auctions, mm -hmm. right? That was, that's a great thing. They realize that their audience loves memorabilia and that pristine auctions realize uh, uh, this is also not the easiest audience to get in front of and boom, you know, it ends up being a great partnership where you can help each other grow and, you know, giving away, you know, signed memorabilia. I mean, there's almost, it's hard to find a, a better giveaway for a Patreon page or, or something like that. So again, this is, that's it. Now I, you talked about, I get you know, a, a castigated by some in the business as being too polarizing, but I can promise you and anyone that, that sort of has been on the business side of fantasy football, everything okay? Should I no, stop? There's a no, no, no. That wasn't towards you. There's a fucking fly going. There's around. a fly. Okay, I, I thought I was about. To, I, thought, I, was, I was about to go too far. Yeah, I, you're I, you're I didn't want to grab I was about to get too edgy. Uh, no, but you're good to go. The basically, if you're on the business side of fantasy football and you've worked with me, it, it's just it's different, right? It's 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 not like we're, we're I'm not uh, beefing with it with anyone on the business side. That's <laughs> it's it's really uh, the. The personalities can beef, but 
but on the business side, it's not, you know, we're, we're, we're just fi- trying to help each other at all times. And if you have a big brand that where there's some kind of alignment where you have an audience that, you know, I, I would love to get in front of and vice versa, we're probably going to end up being friends and there will never be a beef. Right. Right. But for some people that, you know, troll me on social media and they didn't know that I have zero tolerance for being trolled. Right. And if, if they were, if they had a bigger audience or we were partners already, then it would be a tongue in cheek thing and we would be winking in our DMS. But if not, they just get flamed. And my response back is, well, maybe you should have had a bigger audience. Maybe you should have, uh, you know, uh, reached out to me prior. Maybe you don't even follow me and you're trolling me. Get out of here. It's not going to happen. And that's the thing that that's something that I think is missed a little bit is that there's a whole set of people out there that I get along with great. And then another, hence the polarizing and another set of people that, that hate my guts. And I, I wish th- those that, that hate my guts would take a step back and say, well, how did we get to this place? Right. And I can promise you that how we got to this place nine times out of 10 is you objected to something I said on social media. You were trying to call me out. You were trying to hold me accountable. And this is a game within a game, dude. I don't need to be held accountable for my bad takes. I get enough of that shit on YouTube. Hey, have you ever read your YouTube comments? Yeah, they're not fun. You shouldn't, right? <laughs> I get enough of that. Yeah. All right. So if anyone with any kind of presence on social media or in this industry wants to pull that shit, well, there is a zero tolerance policy. We practice deterrence. So those tweets are going to get read on the show and I am going to respond as harshly as I possibly can. And a funny thing has happened in the last year. I have a much bigger audience and a lot fewer critics. Yeah, so you're scared. I believe the deterrence is working. And it's also like I have nukes, guys. I have nukes. And it's funny how many peace treaties and how, how much good, you know, good relations we now have that I have nukes, right? And I don't have a big brand. I, I don't, I'm not ESPN. I'm not uh, fantasy pros. Not yet. Right? My audience is 100% organic. They, I remember I started the podcast with 25 people, right? Listening to the show. And then eventually, you know, we grow to a place where now I'm very proud that, you know, I will hear about it. Right. If, if someone wants to take me down on social media, I will hear about it through the minions. They will let me know. And oftentimes they will respond and do my job for me on social media. And there's no more, there's no more gratifying source of pride than seeing someone that you know is a patron that supports you on Patreon, has provided you with positive feedback in the past come and cape up for you on social media. So that's why I I love social media. It's my way to have my finger on the pulse of the the sporting public, my audience, and and, and also a place for me to, you know, uh, sort of get that positive validation because you really need that. Oftentimes for many years, I was toiling away in a small office in the back of my house hoping that people would go to this website and enjoy it and need it, hoping people would listen into my show. But I didn't know. I didn't know. And, and if we didn't have all these ways for the public and our audience to talk back to us, I don't know if I would have kept going. It's a, it's a depth over with thing, the way I look at it too. And that's why I think the fact that you have people that dislike you but also people that equally love you. It's, it's just two sides of the same coin. If you're in the middle, if you're meddling in the mediocre, like you don't there's have- There's a middle? There, uh, yeah, there's not- I didn't know that. I didn't know that people could be in the middle. 98% of the industry is in the fucking middle. That's why it's I hard thought to they hated me or they liked me. Oh, no, I didn't mean for you. Everyone either hates you or loves you. That's, that's I the thought only. so. I, I, I want to find that middle guy. 
No, they're like, ton- I kind of like him. He's okay. No, I'm all right. He's, he's fine. No, the people that are creating within the industry, most of them fall into the middle. And I oh, think they, yeah, they, 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 they retreat to the middle. Yeah, because they don't want to be wrong, stagnant. Nick. Yeah. You don't I mean, want to be wrong. The only you reason I signed your take, man. You can't yeah. be wrong. You want to make sure that all the proper context is given and that your take isn't too hot, but it's just hot enough, right? You just want to be the Goldilocks. You know, there's, there's just a bunch of Goldilockses out there walking around with their little baskets. That's what I see when I look at the fantasy football ecosystem, the, the analysts out there. And I, and I tell all of them to their face whenever we talk in person or I'll come on my show. I'm like, be bolder, man. What do you got to lose? It's fucking sports. It's fantasy sports. Again, it's the game within a game. This isn't a... a, 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 a medical uh, industry show we're not talking about saving lives it ain't that important right this isn't we're not emergency response technicians you know lives are not in our hands man it's did damian williams is he going to score two touchdowns or not and by the way in that one monkey knife fight contest for the super bowl i did have damian williams debo samuel and tyree kill and we did a contest where you had to pick a trio of players in the Super Bowl, and no one could beat me across you know, all my audience playing on Monkey Knife Fight. I had the best lineup. I had the nuts. And okay, they just well, have to eat it. You just have to eat it that the pod father so often has the nuts. If you do go sign up on Monkey Knife Fight, use promo code BDGE. Don't use pr- player profiler. Or I didn't say there. my promo code. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just I didn't say you. my promo code. No, no, no. I'm not here I, to promote. I want to circle back to when I'm not even, I can't even talk fantasy football. No, you cannot. I can't believe I said Damian Williams. It's going to get bleeped out. You're lucky. I, I let that slide only because I, uh, I thought we were going to like have a self-pity party because I had Damian Williams at like 25 to 1 for the MVP. He got fucking robbed by Patrick Mahomes. Oh, Stop. That's right. No, we're not getting – we're not right. going down. That's right. Ever. That's right. That was a great – Hey, man. Hey, man. Stop. 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 Process play. Process play. Process Stop. play. We're not doing I lo- processes. I, I, all I care about is the process. The only process we're talking about is business process. You said you started off, you know, you have 25 people listening to your show in the beginning. That's extremely difficult as a content creator. But anyone out there starting, you have to understand that even the great Matt Kelly has zero, five, 10, 20 people listening to his show when he starts. It's very difficult when you do start. And you have to start doing things that uh, go against the grain, that are truthful to you. Because that's how you grow. You connect with, I, I think one of the things that I've tried to preach over the last like year or so, not even preach, but one of my, one of my deep beliefs is that I, I literally don't care about the fantasy football industry. I do like connecting with people within it, like yourself, like the fantasy footballers who I think are like-minded to me because our personalities click. And I think we could have good, valuable conversation that helps other people out. But in terms of focusing your energies, it is 100 million times more valuable focusing your energy on your community than the fantasy football community itself. Like there are a lot of people that spend all day on Twitter, you know, interacting with other people trying to like fit in and make friends and things. And that's fine. But like Matt said, if he didn't focus so heavily on his community of 20 people, that shit wouldn't grow. And he wouldn't have one of the strongest brand loyalties in the industry right now. Cause from where I see it, I do think it's you guys and the fantasy footballers up there competing for the strongest brand loyalty. Obviously they have a lot more views and uh, subscribers and whatever, but in terms of like ratio, you know how they do like pound for pound with boxing. I feel like you guys are up there, if not very close to where they are. So when you are starting off, I mean, the numbers might sound intimidating, but focus on your community because those are the people in the end that are going to help you grow bigger and help you stay with the foundation that you started with and help you stay truthful to, to who you are as a person. Absolutely. Yeah. The, I, 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 once you get a thousand, I mean, that, that is really the number. That's the magic number. A if you can get a thousand fans, fans mm-hmm. you just get to get a thousand fans, get a thousand people that'll cape up for you. Uh, whether it be that they will uh, support an argument you made on Twitter, whether they will become a patron on patreon.com, doesn't matter. A thousand people and you can build a business because those are the people that will support you as an artist. Those are the people that will buy your products. And you just need to focus on 
building products and offering services that will help those people. And one of the things that I did, I've only discontinued one service. We're just adding services, right? Mm -hmm. Building apps and adding features. And I did discontinue one service, which was helping people with their fantasy teams because that was not scalable. Exactly. That was at a point where mm -hmm. I was inundated with requests to help people with their fantasy teams. And that, and, and a one-on-one -on -one conversation when I have an audience of a thousand that I could be helping by sharing feedback on social media or talking about it on a show, if you sit down and, and, and I recommend this to everyone that, that wants to do this full time, it is you, you create a calendar for the day and for the week and you break it down into 10 minute segments and say, what am I doing in this 10 minute segment? What am I doing in this 10 minute segment? And how many people am I touching? How much value am I creating? doing these tasks and these activities and the place with the lowest return was these one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I kept increasing the price from $40 to $80, you know, and, and I could never get yep. the price to a place where it made sense business wise for me to devote time to helping an individual with their team one-on-one -on -one, as opposed to, putting out content that can be consumed by thousands of people. So that was the one area, but, but I partnered with someone who was doing that in a way that they had found a community of consultants, someone that the fantasy football King, Patrick Murphy. So I, I worked with him to help magnify his, uh, his voice and expand his reach so that if someone says, hey, I, I need help managing my fantasy team, I just don't have time, and I'm in this competitive league, and there's a lot of money at stake, instead of me saying, I can't help you, I always want to be able to help a member of my audience in any way. If I can't help them, hey, this guy Patrick Murphy, he's really mastered this aspect of it that I could never wrangle um, from an ROI perspective. I always wondered, I always wondered actually about that relationship you guys had. I don't know who he is. I only know him from you talking about him on your podcast. So he's not sponsoring your show. You are becoming basically the middleman in a way that you can deliver value to your audience outside of you just presenting your own analytics. You're saying like, okay, I can't, you know, do this for you, but I'm still going to find a way to be the value plug for you, even if I can't do it myself. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I could still offer him a sponsorship and he right. did sponsor our app um, and our show for a period of time. Absolutely. But this was all because I felt like I needed to, uh, to bridge a gap in the services that I was no longer able to render. And then he came along and said, Hey, you know, I've been listening to your show and you know, I think that we can work together. And it was just, it's just, again, serendipitous things happen. And at this point, so many serendipitous things have happened. So many different people that I've uh, come into contact with where we found ways to help each other, whether it be you or Patrick Murphy, or, you know, just like I said, a long list of people, it's, it, it can't be luck, right? There's just no money. There's no, there's no way you can roll the dice this many times. It, it, at that point, I feel like I'm doing the right thing by me because the one thing when you work in sports or you work in something that is fairly, I don't want to say trivial, but leisure activities, again, we're not curing cancer. We're not participating in something that is advancing the human race scientifically, okay? And I feel like I have a, a significant amount of willpower and, and some brain power to offer, but I've opted to do this with my time, right? Analyze a sport and a game within a game. How do you justify that? Well, that, that's one of the ways that I justify it in that there's just no way I'm not doing the right thing. This is what I was meant to do. Otherwise, you know, th th there's just no way the universe would be talking to me this strongly 
uh, I'm, I'm doing something right and I need to continue to do it. That's how I feel. And, and also, you know, I went and read a book about, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, industrial revolution and the advent of leisure time. And I now have a, a much bigger appreciation for leisure time that the, the, the pleasure people get from us, Nick, from playing fantasy football is the downtime and the battery recharging that allows them to go out and cure cancer. That's how we rationalize it. It's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I guess I never, I, I never uh, thought of it that way, but I do get contacted by people, you know, via email or DMs or whatever, telling me about how my show or just like being entertaining for an hour has helped them in their real life. And I always appreciate that stuff because as, it's someone, huge. Who's, as someone who's doing stuff that, like you said, is, is almost trivial in a sense that doesn't really matter in the landscape of things. Uh, it does matter to people on an individual basis and it goes down to affecting and impacting people on an individual basis because as you scale, you'll scale the number of people that you do end up helping out in their real life. And like you said, like just by pure numbers and analysis, like you will, if you're helping one person now, you'll be helping 50 people in a year. And of those 50 people, someone in there is going to be doing something extremely, extremely valuable to maybe the human race, science, whatever it is. And you will be uh, a piece of their story when you look back on it. So it is a, and it's also important it. that I make people laugh on my show. So I only have two goals when I do a show, inform and entertain. And there's that, it's like a shot clock in my head. If I'm talking to a guest, for example, or I'm doing a monologue, am I at this moment in time on the court either entertaining or informing? And if I'm not doing it, I need to pivot to something else. I need to go somewhere else. And, and part of that is make people laugh, whether it be with a boner sound effect or, you know, whether it be completely freaking out and, and losing my mind for a moment and, and yelling at nameless, faceless, uh, you know, trolls or whatever it is. I, 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 it's important to me that people are laughing in the car at the show. And because that really, that levity is important for all of us. Yeah. You, I mean, you do a great job of intertwining those two source like types of um of value because the way i look at it is value can come from entertainment information or motivation in a sense and i think every type of value kind of pushes itself into one of those three categories and it's a very fine line to walk between offering your audience value through entertainment because sometimes that that just doesn't work but you do a really good job of walking that line um, and like when you do go off on people, like you said, like sometimes the start of your podcast will literally just be 20 minutes of you shitting on one person on Twitter. And it's something that I should not care about whatsoever, but I listened to the entire thing. And afterwards I'm just like, I don't know why the fuck I just listened to that thing, but I found it super entertaining. And in a sense, that's value to me. And that's something that's just so different in our industry. And I actually, I asked this to Andy, uh, on last week's interview, and I'm going to segue into it with you. Because you're someone who's already pretty pretty competitive in the sense if someone comes at you, you're going to strike back. We're in an industry right now where it's so friendly and everyone wants to be friends with each oh, other. God. And again, I'm, I'm fine with that. Like on a on a person to person basis, like if you're a good person and you're in, you know intellectual and whatever, like we'll probably get along pretty well. But like, I think that as we see the industry grow and a lot more money pile in via advertising and sponsors people will realize how much of a land grab this industry truly is and things will get a little bit more competitive, not just on like the bickering social media shit, but from a business standpoint. So I was kind of curious like um, how you see the influx of new companies, new startup softwares. Like I'm sure you get emails all the time throughout the summer about um, you know being an affiliate with this new app or that new website and shit like that. There are a lot of new companies just popping up because the fantasy sports industry is growing so quickly. Sports We're, gambling as well. Sports gambling as well, right. And that's not even, that, that's a whole nother niche that we could possibly spin off to. But as the content creators, we're going to have a lot of leverage over where that money goes. So you're going to see the people that aren't looking at it this way, start to look at it that way and become a little bit more competitive. Is that how you see the space going over the next few years? I don't know. I don't know. It, it's, 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 it's a uniquely uh, uh, serene landscape with very few uh, arguments with, with uh, and, and very, I just, it was the thing that really struck me when I, I first started the content creation. Because what's one of the signature aspects of fantasy football? Arguing. Trash talk. Yeah. 
right? Smack talk. Like even apps like the ESPN fantasy football app, there's a smack talk board. Like there's a smack talk button. And yet we're always so polite arguing with each other and want to make sure that they're, they're, that everything's cool. And then, you know, and that, that there's no hostility or, or, or bad blood between analysts. And I'm like, why? Why? This is the weirdest thing. This is an industry that is built around smack talk and we can't smack talk. The guys that are analyzing this game built on top of yet another game, we are going to be the ones that take this super seriously. Like I just couldn't believe the amount of self-serious analysis and just the posturing, the self-serious disposition of so many analysts as if they were again releasing the data on a clinical trial for <laughs> a new treatment for leukemia yeah. it's like what the fuck are we talking about man and so i've always looked at this like the wwe from the beginning i'm like i am a wrestler when i go in front of the mic when i'm on social media right and i'm sorry if you didn't get the memo or or, or you didn't know that the, the, the wrestling is a show more than it, it, it's not the ultimate fighting championship, right? Like people, the, 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 it, it's not life or death in the cage, right? These guys are putting on a show. I'm putting on a show out here because none of this is that serious. And then it's also a big reason why I periodically will go to like the FSGA conference and I'll meet people in person. Like I'm going to the NFL draft. I'm sure I'll meet up with a lot of fellow analysts that I've only followed for a period of time and never actually met in person. It's important mm -hmm. to meet in person. And then we could, it, it, because I've always, I always imagined when I was a kid what it would be like to see or be on the plane with like Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan as they're drinking beers and they're talking and they're putting their arm around each other after they just pretended to be mortal enemies and beat each other up. Yeah. And then behind the curtain, they're, they're buddies. Right. So I, I always thought that was a cool idea uh, and concept. And I know that, and, and then you know, Evan, Evan Silva told me, he's like, he's like, man, I don't think anyone else in the industry has gotten the memo from you that, that this is just, you know, a, a, professional wrestling I, they, they 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 think that you really mean it you no know, i'm like, like i'm like I, I i'm like i i i'm not it's not my job to put the memo out and send a letter out to everybody that that there is that this is you know it, certainly there's a tinge of, of 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 serious intent here but it's more tongue-in-cheek than it's not and if, and if you didn't take it that way then you're not in on it. But here's the beauty of it, Nick. Here's the best part of it. Everyone that's a fan of us, they're in on it. All our patrons, mm -hmm. because we're talking about the behind the scenes mechanics of the show, they're in on it with us. So now we can bring thousands of people with us and they can all be in on it. And then when we stumble across that guy that's super self-serious, who's not in on it, it becomes yeah. a... a we roar with laughter. Yeah. I think that's what's going to separate everybody that separates himself over the next three to five years is making that, I guess I never looked at it uh, from like a WWF standpoint, but it's creating the brand behind the person because there's so much data. It, the, the information is so saturated in our industry that it makes me want to quit Twitter altogether. Like two years ago, I used to use Twitter to actually get valuable information from people and I just don't have time to sift through the shit that's not like there's some people I follow that will tweet out great stuff and valuable information, but like 80% of the stuff they tweet out is just them linking to their new blog posts or their new podcast, et cetera. And it's fine to do self-promotion and self-marketing. Like I admittedly do it too, but I try to keep that stuff to a minimum and they get to the point where you can't really find the informational, uh, that, that value anywhere in the information because so many people are putting it out into the world. So that's going to become uh, redundant, a lot of the information, a lot of statistics outside of like the advanced metrics that you do, which I want to dive into in a second, um, that's going to become redundant. And eventually the only thing that's going to separate you from other people in the industry is going to be that WWF character of yourself. 
Yeah, Twitter for me, it, num- the number one utility of Twitter is jokes. Yeah, hundred percent. Make jo- I like take. I don't want to take it serious. That you're not going to see. And, and this is why we have two different accounts, right? I have at Roto Underworld. And we have top 10 lists of all these metrics and it's a data heavy place where you can get a lot of great data at Roto Underworld. If you're interested in the stats and the metrics and that's your focus, you should go there. If you're more interested in seeing me high five someone behind the scenes because we just did a big joke or a big prank on someone or me making, uh, you know, uh, talking about how I asked a, a football player during an interview if Jeffrey Epstein killed himself, you know, like, yes, th- those, th- that, that's what m- at fantasy underscore mansion is on Twitter. That's where you're, you know, the conversation after the show, the post show and the pre-show conversation is just person. an extension of seeing me as a person express myself. And sometimes that's taking a victory lap Yeah, that I, I aced all the props in the Super Bowl, right? Or, or, you know, relishing in being big wrong, right? So if you call me out for being big wrong, I could take it either way. I can either, if you have a big voice, I'll probably use it as an opportunity to take you down and we can <laughs> meet in the ring and we can do our WWE thing. Mm-hmm. But if you're just a random dude, I'll probably retweet you, you know, and be like, yeah, got me, dude. Good one. Yeah, I think it, it's so ironic that people have such a problem being people, like being themselves. And that's the reason why some people, I think, have a very uh, tough time breaking out a little bit and, and showing themselves to their audience. It's like uh, people try and they're like, yeah, I love coffee. And I'm like, that's not like opening up and and telling people who you are as a person. Like you said, you know, making the Jeffrey Epstein jokes. It's the reason I vlog a lot. Like I really show people, you know, I'm like, I'm not afraid to talk about our fucking negotiation deals. Like how often do you hear that kind of stuff on podcasts with like hard numbers? Because people that are outside of it are interested in that stuff. And I think if you're the one to peel back the curtain and show them that they'll have an undying respect and loyalty to you because they, they know that you're there to tell the truth. And I think that's the way that you build a brand and a following like the right way. Yeah, if you are uh, unabashedly honest and a total open book, I've tried to be that from the beginning, a total open book with people about what we're doing, how I'm feeling at this very moment. And if if, if you drop the facade and and there's no veneer, then there is something authentic about that interaction. And that is how you create a loyal audience. It, it, It... it, it, that authenticity is the most valuable thing as a, a, a producer of content, especially in a video medium that you can possibly bring to bear. And, and it's, it's how our podcast took off because mm-hmm. I was droning on and on about what this metric means and what that metric means. And we were stuck with hundreds of listeners. I remember this inflection point. And then there was a show that I did where I was just getting – annoyed about film grinders dismissing Tevin Coleman as a running back prospect. And it was just, it was driving me completely crazy because, you know, we have advanced metrics like, like speed score, which factors in a player's speed with their size, puts them together, creates a speed score. Uh, So basically size adjusts your speed. And it's also one of the most predictive metrics for grading prospects right? It makes sense. If you're big and fast, you're probably going to be a good running back unless you're Kristen Michael, right? So Tevin Coleman clearly was going to have this and yet he was being dismissed as having poor vision and not elusive enough in in space and all this stuff. And I was just like, this is, I I hate this. Stop it. It was bothering me. I, I could feel it in my stomach, but I started a show and I was just doing my thing, like listing some numbers. And I was like, Hey, and then somewhere, I don't know what happened during the show. I just, I don't know. I just said, fuck it. And I was actually at that time, I was recording a show on blog talk radio by calling in the show with on, on a, on a, on a, on a, a, a wireless phone, like a landline. 
right? You would look at a handset that you hold. I'm, but I I'm had old like enough a, to remember those. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, was, it was a thing. Like, yeah. it, it was, just t- go 10 years ago. So, and then you would plug a headset into this little uh, wireless landline and you could walk around. I could walk around the room with the head, but I had always just sat at my computer. And I just, I, I just started, I stood up, I started, you know, pacing back and forth and just started yelling about how upset I was that Tevin Coleman <laughs> wasn't getting the respect as a running back <laughs> prospect. And I just went, and I, and I just started, I, I was creating all these analogies to have Tevin Coleman were, you know, on the Serengeti that he would be like a, an apex Christ. predator and all this stuff. And, and, I, and it was like 10 minutes go by. And then next thing I know, different people, the few that were listening are tweeting about it. They're retweeting. You got to listen to, to Fantasy Mansion talk about Tevin Coleman. It's priceless, you know? And then boom, that was like the moment. I remember that specifically. I remember that show. I remember what I was feeling in that moment because it was super liberating to just be myself. Now, there's a microphone in front of me. So here's the other rule for content creation. If there's a microphone here and there's a camera there, you have to amplify yourself. No one wants to see the human being being just uh, gliding through a day. That's not as interesting. You can be yourself 100% authentic and just turn the dials up on all the things that you do, whether it be uh, your hand gestures and your tone of voice. You can just amplify yourself and be a, a bigger character than you normally would. But that's what you're, you're supposed to do that when there's a camera there and there's a microphone here. It's not as interesting to hear someone talk with their normal, more quiet cadence without any expressiveness. No one wants to watch that on YouTube. It's not interesting, right? Uh, it's not as interesting as someone that's actually being expressive and if you have that ability to be uh to to amplify yourself as a personality then you should take that opportunity and i learned that at the in that moment and it it hooked people and i said okay well this is uh, i i just need to let it go man i just need to take a deep breath and let it go and i've been doing that ever since yeah i i would probably disagree on some of those parts because I'm, I would consider myself a, a pretty monotone person. Um, I'm not someone that really rare. I rarely get loud. Sometimes I'll yell in the beginning and then I'll tell, I'll tell my audience to stop yelling, even though I'm the one that's yelling and I'll, I'll, I'll move up and down a little bit. And I have hand gestures just cause I'm from New Jersey and my hands never stop flying around. But my, my only concern with doing that is, is, um, and I know you look at it from more of like a WWF perspective. You said, you know, you turn the dial up a little bit. I never want to put myself in a position where I turn myself into a, into a, you know, ironically a caricature of myself because right. then it seems like when you want to do other things, you're putting yourself on this pedestal. You're putting yourself in a position where now you have to act differently than who you are, you know? And that's my one concern with doing that. So, um, for the most part, I don't get much different than the way I talk now, but I just, but that's you, man. Yeah, you're right. That's you. That's who you are. You're being true to yourself. I am, I come from a family, uh, you know, my, my dad in particular, he was super expressive. Uh, If you were outside, if my dad was on the phone when I was a kid and you were across the yard, you could hear him on the phone talking to his friends. Like we're, it's just a very expressive. uh, And I wasn't that way. Uh, on my show, and I don't know why. I I just wasn't being true to myself. But anyone that spends time with me knows that I get fired up about things that aren't even that important. And you know, uh, fantasy football isn't that important. But God damn it, I was fired up about Tevin Coleman in that moment, and I just let it go, man. I just let it go. I mean, that's a great. That's a great like background story to have for your brand like it's it's so cool that we live in a day and age when things like that happen 
and you can document it all, right? Like you could point back to it and be like, yo, that was crazy. Like I was outside of myself in a, in a sense, but those types of pieces of the puzzle are like what build the brand story and what build to who you are today and, and why you made it today. So I, it, it's just cool. Like the, the time. When I feel it room. gurgling and bubbling up inside me, I just always just, I let it go now. That's I great. just let it go. And I, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a risk, I guess. I didn't know at the time because it was just, it was actually a live show. You know, back when I was doing it on, on blog talk radio, it wasn't yeah. even recording, right? It was just a live show that was recorded and out there and you couldn't edit it or anything like that. So I just took the risk at that time that I wasn't going to be doing my normal, hello, everybody. I'm doing a show now, <laughs> right? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to step outside that, that, uh, that box. Um, I felt comfortable doing it and it felt authentic and it has to. It has to feel authentic. Um, but yes, the, I, 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 I feel comfortable turning up the dials a little bit. Not everybody does. And if, you do it. And after you do it, it doesn't feel good. Like that Tevin Coleman piece, that segment felt really good. Felt right. Like I I was like, I I think I was hard a little bit. Okay. Um, and, uh, kids, that was a joke. So, uh, I think, no, I think I was, I think I was children of men in here. I think I was, yeah, I think I I turned myself on. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I was like, Oh, that felt really good. So, you know, if it doesn't feel, if you try it, it doesn't feel comfortable, right? Um, uh, then that's not something you should pursue. Fortunately, you know, uh, I'm, I'm all about it. I'm yeah. all about freaking out, baby. <laughs> it goes, it goes back to just really being yourself and, and letting, like, you got to let yourself open up and, and become who you are because that's how you connect with the other people. And that's how you build like the real, the real audience behind, you know, what you're doing. So that's a cool story. I can even, t- I, f- I feel like I can tell, man. Can you, I feel like when, when someone is repressing themselves oh, on air, I can tell, man, I'm like, this guy, th- there's some, he, he wants to, he, he wants to, to, to elevate a little bit, but I can, I can yeah. feel it. Some, it's weird. If you've done this for long enough, you can feel it when someone's repressed a little bit. I just think mic. from a human standpoint, it's very easy to tell when people are being their natural selves, like not even podcasting or in entertainment and media or whatever. Like when you interact with someone, you can, you could tell whether they're putting up a facade or not. And that comes off even more so when they're on camera, because you get a little bit more, you know, uncomfortable if you're not being yourself and then you start to dig yourself in a little bit of a hole and then, you know, shit just spirals out of control. So I think that's just like a, a human thing in a sense. And the other thing I will say about your show is you are, again, authentic. But again, you know the camera's on. You know there's a microphone here. Yep. And you want to present well. That was my larger point. Okay. Is it, the onus is on you as a content creator to present well. You should care about every aspect, every pixel of what you're streaming. You should care about what you're saying. Mm-hmm. You should be prepared. And... A lot of podcasts, especially in our industry, they come and go. They come and go. And it, since I started, I mean, I, I, can I, I can't even, it's, it's, it's probably in the hundreds of just dynasty podcasts that have come and gone. And it's clear that there is just not quite enough reverence for the microphone, that people are out here listening, man, and you need to come prepared and, you know, for example, I, when I first started this, I went and I took a public speaking class. And in that public speaking class, we counted all our ums and all our ahs and all our you knows. And then, and you had to go and you had to speak in front of this group at this podium and train yourself to pause instead of using these, these sort of crutch transitions. And all of it and, and, and all of it is to serve the audience. And so that, that was just a little bit of the, of the behind the scenes work. It's crazy to think back. I rarely do this. And it, that's why I appreciate you having me on the show to do this reflection because I don't think we do it enough. You Not know, really. we're always looking at what's next, what's next, what's next. But it, it is, it, it, there is some gratification there looking back and going, yeah, I remember that. I remember taking that public speaking class. 
that was kind of sad, <laughs> but I'm glad I did it. I'm better because I did it. All these things I was trying to do just to serve the show, the site, whatever it was, and be a professional. That was my goal. I wasn't just going to turn the mic on and, you know, uh, riff for 45 minutes. That's not it. Yeah. I mean, it, it comes off in your show. Like you talk about being prepared. I think a lot of shows fall short in that sense as well. And I actually wanted to ask you how much you do prepare for individual shows, because when I'm at my peak of what I'm doing, if we're, if we're July or August and I'm in the middle of my research of doing everything to prepare for the season, I typically, if I need to go on a show for someone else, or if, you know, if I'm guest podcasting, I don't really even need to sh see the show sheet because I prepared so much outside of it that I can kind of go off the top of my head and I'll have stats for every single player. But when I do my individual videos, the process it takes to actually put one of those out, if it's a 45 minute long form video, the research that goes into it, the notes that you take for it, take hours and then obviously filming it, editing it, uploading it takes a long time. So there's so much prep work that goes into it. Your shows are very long form too. They're usually over an hour. They're filled with valuable facts and stats and analysis and just like your opinions on things. And you seem to be able to weave it through the entirety of the episode without like pause, no like awkward kind of transitions and pivots and stuff. So my question is one individual dynasty show in a week, right? Like how much prep goes into that for you? Well, I'm constantly, I have basically a Google doc and I'm constantly putting stats and ideas, a premise, uh, you know, a two player dichotomy. I'm always putting topics in this sheet all the time. And I have it on my phone. I have it wherever I go. Sometimes I even might email myself if I don't have the app, you know, real handy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm always thinking about, you know, what, even an analogy I'm always writing it down, always, 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 because I learned early that if you think that it's such a great idea that there's no way you're going to forget when you sit down to do a show, it's trust me, trust me, you'll forget. You got to write it down. So the whole goal is to make these the monologues especially feel rift, seem rift, sound rift, but in effect, I'm, I'm, going off a carefully choreographed set of talking points every time. And whenever I, I'm about to interview a guest, I always send them all the questions in advance. Because again, this is part of being a professional and serving the audience. The audience doesn't want to listen to someone have to ponder an um and ah and, 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 and uh, do that. You know, uh, just, uh, uh, figure out an answer, right, for what could be 5, 10, 15 seconds before they finally get their thoughts together. Why not send them the questions in advance and then they can sound more professional and prepared? And the beauty is, and this is, and I, musicians talk about this, is that if you've done all this practice and all this prep and, and, you, and, you've, and you've shared the questions in advance, it actually allows for more organic conversations and it allows you to feel more comfortable segueing into uh, even non sequiturs. Like I do this all the time on the show. I'll start talking about something completely unrelated, like there will be blood <laughs> and how much I like that movie or some aspect of that movie. And then I'll transition back to, because it's written down because I have the timeline for the show right there and I'm not getting lost. And at no point, it, what's my goal? It happens, but I try to minimize the amount of times that we're stumbling, stumbling around and fucking it up. And, and the guest is filibustering to try to get their thoughts together. And there's nothing I like better than having a guest email me back the questions with their answers. You sometimes you'll find a super prepared guest that actually will write out all their answers in advance. And that's like, Oh my God, that's amazing. Interesting. Now, we're actually free to riff even more within this super prepared set of thoughts as opposed to wasting the audience's time with a bunch of filler. Yeah, that's interesting. I knew that you sent the show sheet over to the guest, but when you do your individual monologues, 
it's it, what I love about your show is like you literally uh, the only thing you have to work off of is the title of the show, which is obviously not giving you any sort of information towards the show. You have no fucking idea what you're in for when you turn on one of your podcasts and to be able to build a brand around that, be able to have people wanting to keep clicking on that to listen without even giving you some sort of semblance of a subject is fucking that's powerful like that really is and it's something that i admire you for and i really like the content that you put out because you never know what you're gonna get and i think like i hate that i can't do that because on youtube if i start just doing random titles my views will dip dramatically because like you said youtube owned by google it needs to be more search friendly and shit like that so you'll never have one of your podcasts go up be like top five rookies of 2020 like you won't do that but that's almost every single piece of content where you went the complete opposite way. Derrick Henry, unsustainable unicorn. Yeah, exactly. Like that's it. And like, <laughs> obviously I know, I know there's a good like Derrick Henry rant coming at one point, but that's about all I know. So the way you do your individual monologues, you never know what you're going to get. And you make it seem, you make it seem as a podcaster, like you don't even know what the fuck you're about to weave into. So it's interesting that you say that they are well-prepared. I just want people to understand how much work actually goes in behind the scenes to make it seem like there is no work behind the scenes. You know, it's a very underappreciated part. I'll tell you something else. If I am going to beef with another fantasy analyst, especially one that has a sizable audience. Oh, you got a little black notebook, huh? I will actually write down whole sentences, specific takes or specific turns of phrases, almost like a comedian has a black book for their set. I will create something like that for the beef I'm about to launch because again, I'll be in the shower or I'll be driving and I'll think of a very specific phrase or a very specific thought that I want to express and I don't want to lose it. So I will write it down. And then the trick is like an actor is to say the line without the audience feeling like it's a part of a script. Yeah. I mean, it's very, it's very well done. And, and the fact that you can make it feel like it's not a script is, um, is just something that needs to, to be recognized. I just, I wanted to let you know from, from one Thank content you, creator to another, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's very well done. And I wanted to, this is a terrible segue and you would probably make fun of me if I was actually on your show, uh, doing it this way, but I wanted to circle back on something that you talked about in the very, very beginning. You know, we've talked about you investing your money. You talked about that your main competition, you see as PFF, Pro Football Focus, which I think is correct, but I also think it's interesting from the point of view that you guys, I think you're, uh, you're, you're competitors because you both provide advanced metrics that you can't get elsewhere because you have people doing the legwork that bring you those advanced metrics. Now, when we talked briefly uh, on our last call, you said that you actually outsource work to people to watch these games to bring in the metrics, right? So yes. my, my question is like, are these people within the fantasy industry? Are these people that like we know and, and you're, you're paying them to do so? And like how many numbers are they reporting back on? Because a lot of these like advanced metrics as, as, as of objective as they are, they are subjective still to the person that's watching that film and writing those numbers down. Right. So I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that because like advanced metrics are interesting to me, but I also sometimes take them with a grain of salt. And I think you have to. Well, that's the difference between grades and advanced metrics. So all of our advanced metrics are observations. They're objective observations. There's no subjectivity. That's the difference between us and pro football focus is they focus on their grades that's their number one product is but even like broken grades. tackles broken tackles that's subjective to the person watching it correct correct an evaded tackle is in some ways subjective in that we create a definition for what an evaded tackle is and there's some aspects of the definition that are in fact arbitrary but when you have multiple people watching a game it's all going to come out in the wash right if you have uh, a trained staff of people that have been watching games and documenting these events on the football field for years and they're cross-checking their data against one another, it's going to be very difficult for someone to observe evaded tackles that didn't exist or vice versa. If that makes sense. So part of it is quality control. Over time, we've gotten better. I'm embarrassed about some of the stats we had four years ago. Because we didn't have the resources 
to employ the number of people that we do to watch these games. We now have two distinct teams. We have a team of people that just does the formation. So who's in the slot? Wow. You know, what's the, what's the, uh, is the, is the quarterback under center or not? How who many people are, are the on cornerbacks these on the field? Uh, you know, all the snaps, who's lined up across from who, all that. And then we have another set of people called the performance scout watching the same game, but they're watching the actual play unfold. Was there a contested catch? Was there an evaded tackle? How many yards were created by the running back on that play? And so on. How many people so are on over those teams? time we've become more sophisticated and I think our data has become more reliable and it's a huge expense because we pay all of our analysts. None of them are, I would say, you know, major uh, fantasy football personalities that you would know off the top of your head. But these are football fans. These are people that just love watching football. They love analyzing the sport. And they like to get paid to watch football and, uh, cool and, and, and take, it, take it to another level. And, and so they naturally gravitate to us and to working for us. And again, it's not a lot of money, but they get paid on a per game basis or a per team basis if you're charting formations. And it's a nice way to put a little bit of money in your pocket. And also, it's a stepping stone. So we have some people that have gone from analyzing games and then they start writing. And then lo and behold, they get hired by uh, Establish the Run or Roto World. Like that, it's just, it's, it's part of that. I like nothing more than to have one of my people get quote unquote poached because I know that I don't have a full-time job at the end of the rainbow. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm honest that I, that that's our business isn't growing fast enough. We're not big enough to, to, to have that as a reasonable end game. So my goal is to help people build a career, get started, you know, uh, learn the, the, uh, the process of collecting and analyzing data, how to express themselves, how to analyze it, um, how to create a voice that can be heard and uh, appreciated by the football community and the fantasy football community, and then introducing them to someone that does have a full-time opportunity available. And I've done that on many occasions and I'm always super proud and it's almost like a weird exchange where, you know, a friend of mine at a, at a bigger website will go, well, are you sure this is okay? And I'm like, what do you mean? Am I sure this is okay? I, I want this person to go work for you. Please leave the nest. It's time. Yeah. I think uh, that actually makes me a little bit nervous. I mean, first of all, like your brand has enough uh, pull that when people kind of attach themselves to your brand, like you go to their Twitter and it says like, you know, writer at Roto Underworld or whatever. It's like, okay, this guy is clearly uh, a little bit more serious about content in the space than maybe someone who, you know, is at a, at a smaller space. But point beside that, I, I think that's one of my like bigger fears is building an extremely, I, I like to have like a smaller team. And one of my, as you pointed out, one of my favorite things in the world is helping uh, most of my team is built of uh, of my friends. So helping them build their personal brands, um, as well as obviously they give value back to me in building their own personal brands. It comes full circle. But one of my fears, actually, I don't think I've ever actually really voiced this, is you know when we start to grow and when we become more of more of like a solidified team where we're all kind of major players within the space is losing some of them. And maybe that's a problem of me depending on them too much and not having a backup plan behind them. Um, but it's just a, a random thought that's kind of popped into my head. So I guess, do you think the reason that you love them going elsewhere is because obviously they're getting a better opportunity, but maybe it's because you don't really rely on anyone else besides yourself to make the machine run. Does that make sense? I mean, it is a very self-centered organization here. I mean, this is, I'm the, the founder. I never, I've had opportunities to take investors and I've not done it because again, I, I don't want to run any decisions I make by anybody. Right. And I don't want to be reliant on anybody. And I certainly am. And if there are, there are certain people that if they no longer helped us, it would be devastating. Um, and I hope it doesn't happen. But yeah, I, I, I have had a few 
scenarios unfold in the last few years where we did lose key people and I had to come to terms and develop a game plan and, and dig ourselves out of a hole and, um, and persevere. And once you've done that once, the second time becomes easier and then you develop your, your confidence that you'll be able to get through it. Um, and it's also developing documentation behind the scenes. Like we right. talked about uh, what an evaded stuff. tackle is. I have been, uh, and this is something that I learned when I was in sales, you know, many years ago when I was building a sales team at a startup is, is, is the training documentation and everything that can support everybody that's, that's, that's helping out. I have a very robust Google doc with step-by-step instructions for even the, the simplest and, and most straightforward things that we do. There's a document for that. Um, and, um, and the other thing is I, 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 I always, uh, offer appreciation for everything that people do. I appreciate it, whether they're getting paid or not to contribute. I always thank them. Uh, I always express my gratitude, um, as, and even when it's inconvenient, even when um, we're inundated, those are my priorities every day. When I sit down and I, and I, you know, I meditate in the morning uh, and, I, and I sit down and I, I lay out my to-dos for the day, it's why I don't like to do any shows before 11 o'clock because I have a lot of things that I have to get done. Uh, Mark Twain called them your frog task. So you have your frog task, which is the most annoying fucking thing, but you just got to get it done today. You got to knock that out early. And then I knock all the gratitude-related things out where I, I'm making sure everyone that's helped in the last couple of days understands I appreciate it a hundred percent. And then as the day goes on and we start doing things that are a little bit more creative and, and, and a little bit, a little bit less time sensitive. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I, I think one way to look at it is that, you know, people do work for you, but you also work for them. You know, like you have to, in order for all you guys to succeed as a team, like you have to put the foundation in place. And you said, you know, writing up very, very clear documentation. And I think any good leader should have that kind of system in place because once you have that, you don't really have to worry about the things that I've worried about. And I've definitely been through those points where I'm writing down, like, you know, just how to upload a fucking video to YouTube is really easy if you know how to do it. But if you've never done it before, like uploading a video for dummies, there's a lot of tasks that you kind of take for granted as someone who knows how to do it. So for that things- in particular, I have like a three page document with like 11 screenshots. Yeah. I mean, you need to be doing that <laughs> because like there are so many little intricacies that I could do in two seconds that will take a new person 30 minutes to do. But once they learn it, they'll be able to do it in like five seconds. So I think that, I mean, that's another takeaway for basically any industry. One, a few of the, uh, what I've been doing forever in terms of, you know, the user experience, we talked about it at the beginning. Yeah making player profiler easy, making things that are advanced, simple. That's what I'm trying to do. And so for a long time in in developing software and and being a product manager to develop software systems, which I did, you know, at my first job, um, and then then go ahead and sell and market them, was to take a step back and say, yeah, dude, you've been working with this stuff for years. Of course, you know where all the buttons are. Of course, it's obvious that you would scroll down. Of course, for you, put yourself in the shoes of your mom or someone that's not you know, you know, savvy with this stuff Yeah. and try to like just take a breath and, and lay it out for someone that's new to this and not make a lot of assumptions about uh, the, the computer competence or the online savviness of someone. And you're not talking down to them. You're just being super crystal clear about getting from point A to point B and everybody wins when you do that. Yeah. I I actually, a lot of the times when we bring new people onto the team, I just send them complete video messages. I'll do a 25 minute tutorial, exactly how to do things. And then I could just send them that or the new person onto the team that way. So it's like, depending on how you communicate best. And obviously video has, has worked well for me. I like to communicate via video. I think like micro expressions of people are very underrated, but that's a whole nother conversation. Nick, you're, you're very also, good at video. What's that? You're very good at video. 
thank you thank you um that that's feeding my ego a little bit now now i'm feeling myself and now i'm about to get loud but i think i think it might be time to to shut it down you i I think we could probably riff for like another two and a half hours three hours on this conversation but for the sake of the audience out there they're going to start yelling at me because the conversation was too fucking long or something so we're going to start to wind down a little bit as you said take a breath and uh i don't know nick i don't think i've talked about myself enough Mm, we'll let the, we'll let the audience decide on that one comment down below if you think matt should if we if we should mute uh matt's mic from this point on for the rest of the episode let's talk about let's talk about some uh things outside of maybe business or football or sports related uh other creative endeavors now you said you were a data guy um and maybe like you don't have an artistic side to you but the fact that you lean towards UX tells me that there is a little bit of an artistic side towards you. Are there other creative endeavors? Um, Let me give you an example, like how I said, I would like to work with younger business people, uh, maybe in like five or 10 years when I've established myself as a real, you know, contender in the business space, I would love to teach people how to run businesses. Uh, When I had Andy on last week, he is, he loves to write and he's working on like a children's book. Is there anything over the next, you know, whether it's year three, five, 10, working on a children's book. He is working on a Look at this guy. Game. I mean, you know, you know the fantasy footballers. God, family- I'm not gonna be able to compete with that. They're family friendly. You don't have the you kids, have to- man. Jesus. You- yeah, I know. He's he's got it all going for him over there. So that being said, like, w- what do you have going on? Um, doesn't sound like you got a children's. Book I, I have a charity that where we uh, save babies that are dying. I feel like that's fake. Yeah, shit. I was just trying <laughs> to one up Andy. Yeah, it didn't. Can't work. do it. Can't no. do it. No, I have a. I want to. Uh, develop a show for Netflix. Okay. So I know that's kind of copy Matthew Barry. It's kind of where he started doing stuff like that, uh, producing shows. But I have an idea, a couple ideas for shows. Now that everybody Let's that has a viable script uh, is, is, is their shows are getting made, right? So if you have even a treatment for a show, if you just have a premise, they're going to green light it. Someone's going to, whether it's Hulu someone's going to get it. So you'll, you'll get it made. So now that there's this, there's this uh, uh, golden era for television, this, this, this second golden era of television happening with streaming, everything's getting made. So I have a few ideas for television shows and I have a couple books that I've bought. Uh, it was a year ago and I haven't got to it yet. So this tells you the progress that we're making, zero progress. This goddamn <laughs> player profiler thing is just too successful, Nick. But I uh, I have some books on how to write screenplays. So I want to write a screenplay at some point. It might be bad. I don't know. We'll we'll see about that. It's definitely going to be bad. I also am developing a uh, a stand-up set. So I would like to go bomb on stage at some point and just feel what that's like to just get no laughs on stage. (laughs) I've been... That's like your uh, podcast been, every you know, week. Dude. Uh, cracking jokes on podcasts for long enough. I, I want to go up there by myself in front of a microphone and see if I can take it to the next level. I have some funny stories that, come, that I can tell. Come do it in New York City. Let me, uh, I'll yes, break a laugh I'll, for you. I'll absolutely die. I can't <laughs> wait. I can't, it was, uh, yeah, please uh, let me die. I, I did, I had this, I had this one uh, joke that I told. It was like a sort of an anecdote about my family. And I told a couple of my friends and uh, my wife wasn't there, but her friend was for some reason. And her friend told her about this, uh, you know, uh, the whole premise that I, that I talked about. And uh, my wife was like, you cannot ever repeat what you said in front of Allison. She told me, she said she was mortified. I can't believe you would talk about that in front of other people should be ashamed of yourself so this is the thing i've always wondered this like you see these comedians that are married and they share these super embarrassing moments on stage and i'm like their wives are okay with this I feel right like- and then I, I always thought about that about howard stern and then he, he and his wife eventually got divorced but he would always <laughs> talk about his penis and and, and, it, and, it, and i'm like this guy's married this is crazy but you probably you know, know what you're getting into when you marry that person. I, I would think, think, right? And I'm like, listen, you have to. you're married to the pod father. That's what I told <laughs> her. I was like, you're married to the pod. What do you think? Uh, of course, I'm going to talk about that time I, I was wearing a robe in a restaurant because we went to a, uh, a, a children's uh, uh, 
sort of a, 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 a Polar Express train ride. And I thought that everyone should wear pajamas, but only the kids were supposed to wear pajamas. But then I was wearing pajamas. And then, you know, the, the flannel pajamas, you know, I, I somehow, yeah, I got, it, it, it was rubbing. And, and then I'm in a restaurant and I'm walking to my table with this robe on and, 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 a, and a boner and, and, <laughs> and it was a problem, right? It was very embarrassing. And she's like, I, and I can't believe you. And then other things. And, and she's like, uh, why did you do that? And I was like, well, the, these guys, they challenged me. They, they, <laughs> I, I mentioned that, you know, I was, you know, was considering doing the standup set. Uh, and then they said, well, get, tell us, tell us something. And I, and I told it and then I'm, I'm sorry. Like I'll, I, you have to tell you. I, I, at that moment, like I've all, I always, you know, I take the L. I won't take the L in fantasy football, but I'll take the L with my wife every time. Just instant L. I, I'm ready to take the L. In fact, I'm taking the L before she even really has any momentum, right? Before she even gets started, I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. This is just so much easier if I just completely take the L. I'm just going to lay on the floor every time. But in this particular case, I was like, I was like, you know what? You are married to the pod father. Amen. So you might need to get ready. Uh, these things, some of these moments might become public. Be, get ready. Yeah. Get ready. So that could happen at some point. I don't know. Happy wife or the happy life or some kind of bullshit saying like that. Yeah, Not, the, that's I'll definitely. I'll never a, know about that. The cliche sounder, dude. You just did the cliche. Fuck. Cliche Whoa. sound effect. <laughs> I'm, I'm fucking furious that you just pulled that cliche sounder on my show. Two observations. Uh, I already forgot what the second one was, but the first one, I feel like when you sit down at the dinner table with your wife, you bring a fucking microphone. I don't know why I feel that way, but I do. I, I love that. Yeah. Second of all, you're, you love talking about boners, so I'm sure you would develop a great skit around boners that would work successfully after you bombed your first like four or five shows. But oh, I, think, oh, I think you would oh, do pretty bomb, well. Bomb, bomb big time. I can't wait to bomb. Why is that weird? That's a weird masochistic instinct that I, I want to bomb. I want to feel that. Because uh, I know sometimes some of our segments or our podcasts don't work, but I have no idea. They're just uploaded and members of our audience are just staring straight ahead. They're not laughing, right? But I never feel that embarrassment. I want to feel it, man. You feel it deep down. You know, you know, when you did something and then you're like, fuck, that was, that was weird or that that's not going to work. I feel like you actually know that. Like I, do. I want, I want to see the blank stares, dude. I don't know why. It's, I did. It's, the, it's one of the weirdest things anyone's ever admitted on so, the show. I guarantee it. So our, I have a, a serious fantasy football league with my friends from high school. We're in like our 11th year. And like four or five years ago, our punishment was to do a stand-up set in New York City at an open mic night. The other, yes. le the other league members were the ones that wrote the jokes for the person going on stage. That just so happened to be the year that I came in last place. So yes! I, have, <laughs> I have experience of doing some stand-up in New York. It was oh, see, I don't, did anyone film it? Uh, oh, yeah. Actually, we vlogged the entire thing. I put it up on YouTube, and the last time I looked, they had taken it down. There was some sort of copyright within the video, and they took it down. And I'm, uh. fucking, I'm forever, I'm forever uh, upset about that, but it was an experience I'll never forget. It was, it was actually, I mean, it's, it's super nerve-wracking, super fun. I had a lot of wine in my system, so maybe that calmed me down a little bit. But the overall like ambiance was, um, it was really... It was it was exhilarating, and I think intense, man. That's why you're probably looking for it because it's a feeling that you don't get often, you know. And those are the the feelings that I feel like you kind of really need to uh, to cherish. All right, random questions. I just want to feel something, Nick. I just want to feel. feel. I, I feel nothing. I need to hurt. I need. I'm just, we're just kidding out there, people. We feel a lot of things. I feel good about these last two questions and the answers that are going to come out of the pod, Father. Now, I stole this question. I love this question. I stole it from Tools of the Titans. Tools of Titans, a book by Tim Ferriss, where he interviews a ton of different experts in different fields. And one of the questions he asks every one of them is, what is the best purchase you have made under $100? I think it's an extremely interesting and intriguing question to ask a group of people. So I'm going to start asking that every Monday on the show. Podfather, $100, what'd you spend it on? We got to go to the data, man. We got to go to the data. And, and if you just go to the repeat purchase data, I have a $95 item in my bedroom that I've bought four times. Dildo. So the, 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 the repeat data purchase says that it's the pants I'm wearing right now. They're, they're yes. The, Can we get the, some leg action? Can we get like a leg? Yes, action? yes. We have them here. 
Let's see here. These are uh, these are these are by a these are by a yoga company, Prana. They're called the Zion Stretch. Zion Stretch. So the beauty is, they look like cool whatever. They look like a semi-casual pants that you can wear anywhere, but they feel as comfortable as sweatpants. Right. Okay. So they 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 feel they're 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 so comfortable and yet they they fit great and you can do any activity in them and you know it's 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 covering half my body at any time. So that that's a lot of of value that I'm getting. And I just went and I bought every color. I got charcoal, I got blue, I got green, I got uh what's the one I'm missing? Uh camel, right? Whatever. Uh, they used to call it khaki, and now it's camel. I don't know. Who cares? So, so, so you're wearing I have all those the colors. I just wear the same pants. People don't even realize these are the same exact pants. I know the size I love. I know the fit. I know the brand. I don't need to worry about the pants thing. Ninety-five dollars, and all my pants are taken care of. So, despite and they're very popular- comfortable. You need great pants when you're sitting down. You need great pants when you're driving. You need great pants when you're standing. There's a lot of value that I'm getting out of these pants, baby. So despite popular belief, the Podfather does wear pants during his podcasts. Good to That's know. That's right. Yeah, they're um, very comfortable. When you answered the show, there's she even just, little air holes in the crotch. So I'm, I'm always ventilated. So you could throw your boner down there <laughs> if you need yeah. to, Podfather. Yeah, it's great. It's great because this was the only answer that you gave back to me on the show sheet. It was funny because you're like, I like getting the answers from people and I don't care if people give me answers back or whatever. We'll just kind of segue the conversation as it goes. But this was the one you, you gave to well, it's me. A tough, it's a tough and question. It is. Tim it's Ferriss a, it's is a one great of the best question, podcasters though, right? in the world. It's a great question. And right? that's one of the better questions you could ask anybody. And there are so many different purchases that you have around you that are uh, under a hundred dollars. I mean, uh, uh, first world problems, hashtag. Uh, but uh, I just, I just, I just have to lean on the data. When you said stretchy pants, I thought my first instinct were that you meant like yoga pants. Like I'm talking like women yoga, stretchy pants, not necessarily pants, pants. And I was like, I didn't take you. These are not form fitting just for the audience. You saw they're not form fitting. They were. You can't see the outline of my ass in these pants. That would be a bridge too far. Very unfortunate (laughs) for the audience members out there. All right. Last question. As Matt would put it, I need one very, 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 very bold prediction for the fantasy football industry as a whole in the near future. One, two, five years, whatever. For the industry or for this season? It's not a football take? This is not a football take. It says in the show sheet. Football take. Bold prediction for the industry as a whole. Come on. Put your glasses on. Learn how to read the show sheet next time, Matt. Come on. Can I do both? I'll let it. Yeah, you could do both. That's perfect. I do both. Okay. Miami Dolphins win the AFC East. And Devontae Parker is the number one wide receiver in fantasy. Stop. Stop. But we, we, need, we, need, we need the second one. <laughs> I love Devontae Parker, man. That's he finally put it together, man. It's the American dream. The diabolical podfather laugh. Right that you there. could just drink chocolate milk and not work out for years and keep your job in the, the, the highest uh, uh, tier of athletics in your chosen sport and, and, and not give a shit. Yeah, you four guys think years. We have a good Devonte Parker is living the fucking life. He hasn't. Had and to do and then you decide to turn it around and become great after all that time drinking Yuhu. You finally you decide you're gonna cut out the carbs and start working out. And Nons- lo and behold, you're AJ Green. That's pretty <laughs> cool. That's a pretty cool story, man. I love the Devonte Parker story. Yeah, AJ so, Green uh, died, so Devonte Parker. It's so could quintessential live. American, man. I love that. Okay, I just love well, that. The, the redemption future. story of, of Devontae Parker, man. I love it. Uh, so, and it's, we always have truthers, right? We always talk about who you're a truther for. Who are you? Who do you still have in your taxi squad and dynasty, but you just can't let them go? And for some people, it was Devontae Parker. And congratulations to those people. I'm one of those people. So, and I'm, and I'm one me. of those people, he goes at the end. And and congratulations to me. It's all about me on the show today. <laughs> you're an idiot. And 
where where uh, the the fantasy uh, football space is going to be uh, in five years, I, I just think that the scoring systems are going to change, and I think that it's going to be – you see already in the Scott Fish Bowl, you see the, the first downs are now uh, a, a thing. I think we're going to get more and more granular. I think the scores are going to go up. I think that finally – most people are going to get over this whole one quarterback thing. They're going to get over the God, fact that so. they might have that, that you could get over the fact that you might have uh, a, a, a empty roster, uh, active roster space during heavy bye weeks. And we can, we'll, we'll, that we'll be looking back in five years and things like first downs and, and some advanced metrics that we would have even been created yet count as points so that and the scores are like 450 to 375 and you're starting two quarterbacks and you're starting three running backs and five receivers with flex and tight ends and, and maybe even other things so that i think is going to happen the complete blowout of scoring and formatting we're going to look back and go i can't even believe people used to play in one quarterback leagues I can't believe you used to play in leagues you start only uh, two receivers. I can't believe you played in leagues where you know first downs didn't count and uh, contested catches didn't count and evaded tackles didn't count. Uh, and you're out of I control also right think now. You're out of control. I also think this is bold. I also think that fifty percent of leagues will be dynasty. That's where you end the show, right? That's where you drop in a little pod father music. That's the show. That was beautiful. All right. Well, we are going to do an outro here because this is not the Roto Underworld Radio. And unfortunately, we don't have that. We don't have that kind of finesse that the pod father does. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. If you stuck around this long, well, fucking, I don't know how you did that, to be honest. We are, we are deep into the conversations. But if you did, again, all we ask I blacked is that, out. Where are we? What's happening? I don't know. I'm blacking out as well. I'm just waking up from my hangover. If you enjoyed, make sure that you share it with someone that you think would find it valuable or informational or whatever. Um, that's all we want to do here is hopefully inspire people to create their own thing or you know keep working hard at whatever you're doing because there is always I don't know if there's always light at the end of the tunnel, but I was about to say something cliche and probably have the alert go off on and me. The sounder, watch I didn't out. Do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But that's all we have for y'all today. I'll see you next Monday. I believe I have uh, Mike Taglieri from Fantasy Pros coming on to talk with me. So that should be a good conversation. Uh, hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And we'll see you later on this week. Thank you, Matthew, for joining me. Yo. What's going on? There we go. Is this my mic? We're good. We're sure? We're sure this is my mic? We're sure? We're sure? Uh, actually, now that you did that, it might not be your mic. What do you think now? Yeah, I think that's it. Do this. this is it, right? This is it. 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 Yes, that is it. That is it. That is it. That is it. Dude, if every guest did that for me, man. Yeah, that was really uh, probably the smartest thing I've ever had a guest do. <laughs> I'm really proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like this. But I, uh, I, you know, I do the, I had a windscreen because I, because of my peas pop. I'm a pop, I'm a pea popper. So I pee, I pop the peas pop, and, pop. Uh, and I'm the pop father. And, uh, that, that wasn't cool. So the windscreen negates that it condenses. Well, it condenses the wave pattern. So I, I can't, I have to, I had to learn to back off when I yell or else everything, which is, you know, or which else is it gets pretty clipped. often. Which is often, so I'm always going like this. <laughs> but this just chair, how to do all of this. Dude, you know what? If I were you, you know what I would do? What's that? The first thing I would do, can I tell you the first thing I would do with your studio? Where you have that fist in the back, I would commission a picture five times that size of my face. Of your face or my face? Well, you're, sorry. If I were you, it if, would be your face. Well, if you send me a picture of your face, <laughs> I'll put it back there. You want to put my face? <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah. Not my face. If you mm -hmm. really look at it, it's like just there's like shit everywhere. It just so. Oh happens. yeah. It happens yeah. If you had a girl way. come over, you have to take that shit down and put the fist back up. Oh my god! Imagine that. Imagine <laughs> that. Imagine <laughs> that. Who the wild. fuck do you think you are, dude? Yeah. I got the Zeke Elliott thing. 
this is really it how the sausage is made in fantasy football you ready for this and it just is a funny face the way his smile is he's just making a funny face i don't like ezekiel elliott i don't like the cowboys but um <laughs> i'm all in on ezekiel elliott this year <laughs> yep. i'm gonna find i'm gonna go find the stats i need i'm gonna go find the justification it's and, just because and, of and, that and i'm gonna be well yeah i just i decided I,